black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. And I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll, I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me, and this look of I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was he was he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? Gio. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Got an extra long show. Uh, Merry Christmas to everyone. Happy holidays or whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate. Uh, Either way, thanks for being here tonight. I know we're coming up on a new year. And if you're like me, uh, so long, good riddance to uh, 2016. Uh, I'm ready for uh, 2017. So thank you for being here. My gift to you is kind of a longer show tonight. Uh, I really hope you guys enjoy the show. Got lots of guests planned tonight, uh, lots of encounter stories, lots of cool things to go over. Uh, so thank you for being here, and thanks for all your support over the last year, uh, letting a schmuck like me in your life. Uh, I know a lot of people listen to me uh, through the podcast, and, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen to the show. I really, really do appreciate it. Like always, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. If you're looking for a gift, uh, even if it is Christmas or not Christmas, if you're just looking for a gift for someone, uh, you can click on the shop at the top and check out the store. Lots of items in there. I hope you're able to get yourself something nice or a loved one something nice. Uh, but sasquatchchronicles.com. Uh, get additional shows, become a member. I hope you get a chance to check it out. You know, not everything is always Bigfoot related. We talk a lot on the show about little people. We talk on the show uh, about giants. We talk on the show about you know many different topics. Uh, there's a lot of different aspects to not just Sasquatch, but stuff that's kind of, uh, you know what I mean, it's kind of uh, surrounding the topic. And tonight's no different. You know, when I had Jonathan Odom on the show, he was talking about seeing this little green person. And I'd asked him, I said, well, is that because of the night vision? It, you were seeing it in green. You know, sometimes night vision, they'll, they'll show it in green. But And he said, no, I didn't have night vision. It was a camera, and it was a little green person. And then I had uh, Mike and Dovey contact me. And I've talked to them in the past, but Mike had something very similar happen to him. I hope you get a chance to go back, listen to the show with Jonathan Odom uh, on the last show. And I don't know if you guys caught that or not. Uh, but Mike had something similar happen to him. I want to go and welcome them to the show. Uh, Mike and Dovey, thank you so much for being on. No, thanks for having us, Wes. Yeah, thank you. And I'll start with you, Mike. I know that you had a very interesting encounter when you were younger. And I know when I had Jonathan Odom on, he was talking about seeing this small green creature. And as we were talking the other night, I was pretty interested in it. So thank you for coming on and talking about it. If you would... For the audience, just kind of start from the beginning. Uh, tell us, you know, what was going on and, and what you saw. Well, it was when I was uh, eight or nine. We lived on the coast over by Lakeside. I know where a lot of people will know where that is, but it's uh, on the coast. It's north of Coos Bay and south of Reedsport. 
But anyway, we lived in a house that was real close to the junction. We lived on the old highway, old highway 101. I was over on highway 101 right at the junction where there's a, a viaduct where Eel Creek goes underneath 101. And I was uh, at that viaduct just checking around, looking for eels and just messing around where I wasn't supposed to be. I had heard rocks moving. I just kind of froze and looked over toward the noise and this green head pops up behind, from behind a a rock, a rock that was about two feet in diameter. And it stands up so I could see its chest, its head, its arms, its hands, its hands were lean, were sitting on the rock facing me. So I got a good look at it and it was a, a little green man. Well, I just froze and just stared down. I was only probably 15 feet away, maybe 20, but closer to 15 feet. So I got a good look at it and it just stared at me for like 10 or 15 seconds. It was, uh, it scared the hell out of me, uh, and and apparently I scared it too. It looked pretty frightened. And for the audience, but, can you can you describe it? Did it would did it look more ape like? Did it look more like a person? It looked it looked like a person. It just looked it looked like any any man would, except it didn't have hair. It, it was bald, uh, but its features were just like a human. It had five fingers, uh, its, it, its arms and its chest were proportionate to its size. For a guess, I would say it was 18, to, 18 inches to two foot tall. It, it wasn't three foot tall, it, it was shorter than three foot, so I'm saying two feet tall. The only thing that seemed different in proportionate would be its ears. It looked, they looked a little bit small but they were the same shape as, as our ears. Uh, the, only, the only difference was it was short and it was green. When you saw the eyes, were they human-like? What did the eyes look like? The eyes, well, it, like I said, I, I startled it as, as it startled me. And its eyes, uh, it was just... It opened its eyes really wide, and the whites of its eyes, they were white, and but the pupils were small compared to the size of the white eyes. It did blink while it was, when, it, when it was staring at me, so it had eyelids. I seen it blink, but its eyes w- looked a little bit, which could have been because it was scared, but its eyes, the whites of its eyes, and then the the pupils seemed small for you know for the size of the for the size of the eyes. That was the only that in the in the smallness of the ears. That was the only difference that that would be any different from any man. What did the creature do next? It it glanced over to the left of it and looked back at me, and then took off running. And it moved fast. I didn't see it wearing any clothes, but, uh, you know, I'm, I mean, it could have been a female, but it was bald. But I, I'm just thinking it was a man. It had, you know, it didn't have skinny arms or anything. Uh, I, it just seemed to me like it was, a, it was a male. But it ran probably 20, 30 feet to a cylinder shape. The only way I can describe it is it it seemed like, I thought it was a barrel when I first looked at it, when I first seen it, about the size of a 55 gallon drum. And it ran to it. Now, I don't remember seeing it go over the top and getting in it, but I know it ran to it. And the next thing I know, or the next second, it just shot up in the air. Now, it was sitting next to a telephone pole, real close to a telephone pole. And I did go over later and look around that telephone pole. And the brush and grass was all laid down 
where that barrel shaped object was. So it it was there. I didn't imagine it. Yeah, that's interesting. Did you tell anyone about this? No. No. I even had really good friends, I mean, that I could tell anything to. But I didn't even tell them. I I just thought they would you know, either they thought I was crazy or I was lying. I was trying to pull something over. I I didn't tell anybody. I didn't even tell my wife until here a few months ago. And after I had told her, we were listening to uh, one of your shows, which we listen to your shows all the time. And somebody brought up, you know, the, the, they had seen a green creature and she tapped me and looked at me and like, she said, remember you told me you seen a green creature. And, uh, but I had never told anyone. I just kept it to myself. Yeah, it's fascinating. I know when Jonathan told me that, uh, you're referring to jo- when I had Jonathan Odom on the show, and he was yeah. talking about seeing this little green person. Uh, I had asked him, originally I was thinking, well, it's night. he's looking through night vision, so he's seeing green. Because, uh, you know, everything's either green or black and white, depending on what which one you have. But And he goes, no, no, this was a normal camera. He goes, the thing was green, and it was proportioned. And he goes, it looked like a little human being, just on a very, very small scale. I'd like to say I was shocked by it, but I really wasn't. As I was telling you and Dovey, uh, I've heard that before from other people. And what it is, I don't know. Uh, If it's the little people, uh, some reports, what you're describing is a lot of what people who see the little people, or even like the Native Americans who describe the little people, that's basically how they describe them. Um, I need to ask, there's a lady down in the Southwest, I need to give her a call and ask her about the green color. That's interesting. I mean, that's got to be terrifying seeing something like that. Oh, it's it it scared me. It scared me. It took me a while just to move uh, anywhere. After, I just stood there for a long time. When I did, you know, and it wasn't because it was dark or anything. It was it was in the middle of the day, probably one two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it was the sun was out it you know there wasn't anything obstructing my view from it and i was close enough like i said i was you know like 15 feet away if i would have dove you know to try to catch it while it was standing still you know uh, which i didn't even think about doing it just scared me so bad but when it took off running there was no way i could have caught it anyway i mean it was fast did the creature vocalize or do any sort of vocalization? No, no. Uh, it had a it had a mouth. Uh, the lips were proportionate to its head. Also, it didn't. I didn't see it um, show its teeth or anything. But uh, it had a mouth. It it didn't make any grunt or sigh or anything. The only thing, the only noise that I heard was the movement of rock and that's why I looked over there when it and then it popped up uh it didn't make any noise yeah. you know not from its mouth I heard it when it ran but it it didn't make any noise as far as a, a grunt or anything yeah that's interesting I would have loved to have seen what you saw and experienced what you saw uh, and, I, you know, the way you described the eyes getting real big looking at you, almost like it was in shock looking at you, probably as much as you were in shock looking at it. Well, that's what I, that's why I think its eyes got so big. I mean, mine, mine were probably also. You mentioned a barrel. Was it, was it a barrel or was it some sort of craft or what, what was it that it ran? I think, I think it was some sort of craft because it shot up in the air, uh, but it 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 was the size size wise it was about the size of a fifty five gallon drum so that's what I thought it was when I when it was running to it I thought it was going to jump in a barrel but that thing shot up in the air and it was really it, what really got me when I walked over to that telephone pole and looked up there were wires strung on that telephone pole and how it kept from hitting those wires i i don't know i i can't explain it uh, because it looked like it went straight 
but it didn't hit any wire. Yeah, and that's interesting. And that's what, you know, when Jonathan was talking about the other night and other witnesses I've spoken to that have run into this, and who knows if it's the little people or if you're seeing something else, you know, alien-related, it's hard to say. Uh, But the witnesses I've spoken with, they describe the speed of how fast they move. Like Jonathan, he scanned with the camera. It was there one moment. He turns back, scans again, it's gone. Uh, And so that's really really interesting. I really thank you a lot, uh, Mike, for coming on the show and sharing it. Like I said, it may not be Bigfoot related, but I was fascinated by it when Dovey sent me the email. Uh, I really was looking forward to uh, talking with you, and I think can't thank you enough for for sharing it. It's a fascinating account. I mean, I don't know what what to think about that. What you saw, um, I believe that you saw it. I just I just can't. It's hard to put in a box. All of this is, to be honest with you guys, all of this is hard to put in a box. Even Sasquatch, it's hard to put in a box. Uh, but something yeah. like that, I'm sure I'll get lots of email uh, people coming forward that have probably seen the same thing you saw, uh, Mike. Usually it takes one person to come forward and say, hey, I saw this. And then other people will come out and say, hey, you know what? I saw that too. Uh, so thank you so much for for sharing it. Well, I'm sure a lot of people think I'm crazy too, but I'm, I, I've seen it. I, I, it wasn't a dream. And I, I even walked over to where the object was the barrel object and the the weeds and the grass had been flattened down so i it was there yeah i don't think you're crazy it's not the first time i've heard this even when i had jonathan on, i think that was the first time i ever aired something like that when i had jonathan on but that wasn't the first time i had heard something like this privately i've talked to people that have as i was telling you guys the other night that have seen the same thing uh, but they don't want to come on the show because it's like, well, where do you put that? You know what I mean? I don't know what I saw. I'm not really sure what I ran into. Uh, but I've had them described everywhere from, you know, a foot and a half to three feet tall. Uh, and green wasn't the first time I've heard that. I, I've heard, definitely heard people describe it as green in the past. And so it's kind of hard to, uh, I would imagine that'll stick with you till the day you die, having that. I'd love to get inside your head and I mean, you did a great job describing it, but I'd love to get inside your head and see what you saw that day. I've lived that minute through my life so many times. And if I ever see another one, I'm going to try and catch it. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. No, well, you guys I, have... I'd be really good at trying to catch it because uh, it, it scared the hell out of me when I was a kid. Anyway, we are... Uh, we're big fans of, of of your show. Otherwise, I if I had just started listening to your show, I don't think I would have came on. Uh, I would have been pretty leery about sharing it. Well, I, but, th- uh, I thank you again for sharing it. I know you guys had some Bigfoot stuff happen uh, on your guys' property. And uh, Debbie, was it down in Texas? Is that what you were saying? The uh, No, Dallas, Oregon. <clears throat> Oregon. Oh, or- oh, Dallas, Oregon. Uh, yeah. If you would, do you guys mind talking about some of the stuff that you guys experienced and uh, whoever wants to take it? Well, we, we moved our home on this piece of property um, several years ago, and you had um, a lot of timber um, you know, right next to our property tree line, and it went all the way to the side of our house. We, it was right next to a tree line and there and it's on the county line so it's out the town's a real rural area the property is on the county line and there's a pasture right next to it so it's out away from people I mean it is in a neighborhood but our house it's on the dead end next to this pasture and the owner of the property would uh, plant different things like one year it was silage. He had cattle one year out there, um, just different things. He would alternate what he what he had out in the pasture. And anyway, we had been there for quite a while, and my husband would go off on weekends to teach a class that he was a part of. And so I would be home by myself on the weekends, and we had been there for a long, for several years. I was never frightened to be there by myself. Um, I felt very comfortable in our house. 
Um, and our two youngest kids were grown and gone by this time. And this occurred, and I, I think, it, I want to say it was real early spring that this occurred. I can't, but, you know, I go through life kind of, kind of mindlessly, <laughs> not thinking about stuff. And this was long before. We didn't know anything about Sasquatch or, I mean, I didn't believe in it um, at this time. We had blinds on our house, uh, on all the windows around the house. Um, except the bathroom um, that was attached to the master bedroom. There was a window that we usually kept open, but there was no curtain or blinds um, on this window. And it was about, it's about four and a half feet up off um, the ground outside the bottom part of the window. And anyway, one, one night when he was gone, for the weekend, I remember waking up out of a dead sleep with this just horrible smell. And I think we had probably lived there a good 10 years by this time. And this horrible smell, I mean, it smelled like sulfur, at sewage. And I thought, what the heck? I mean, it was just horrible. It was, I was, before I could get fully awake, I was thinking I had Satan in my house or something. I mean, that's the type of smell. It was like sulfur. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, it was just horrible. And I woke up and I heard something that sounded like something shuffling alongside the house. And I got up and went into the bathroom. And normally you can see out that window, even if it's dark and rainy, you can see something. <clears throat> but this night I couldn't see anything outside this window. It was not, I mean, I couldn't see out. It was like something, and I don't know, but it was almost like something was blocking the window. But I, you know, I don't know. And I thought about looking out the blinds in the living room or the dining room because the bathroom is on the side of the house that was next to the pasture or the tree line. And I thought about looking out the blinds and for some reason I could not get myself to look out the blinds. I was just so scared. I thought, what if I look out and something's looking back at me and I'm here by myself I just, I couldn't do it. And um, I, you know, went around and rechecked the, the locks on the doors. They were all locked. And I sat there for hours petrified. And I thought about calling my son-in-law to come over, but I thought, well, I don't know. I didn't want to see, sound stupid or like, what if it, it's nothing? Or what if it is something and he gets hurt? I mean, all this stuff went in my head. And so I didn't call him. Anyway, so this was one incident, and I'd had another incident too, but I don't remember how closely together these were. But the other thing is something had went through our trash can, and we had tr our trash cans on the side of the house next to the pasture. And the trash can is about four and a half feet tall, and it has a lid that's connected to it. So you can't take the lid off. You have to open it. And it wasn't knocked over. The, the trash can wasn't knocked over. It was something had went through the trash. And I, I thought maybe a dog, but I thought, well, how could a dog, you know, pick up that lid and go through the trash without knocking it over? But I couldn't think of any other explanation for it. It just didn't make sense. And then also we have a motion sensor light above our garage that we had put up after we moved in we noticed later, we didn't notice it at first, but later we noticed that it was busted out. And also there was a street light, right, not right exactly in front of our house, but just down from our house, there was a street light and it was broken out. And again, we never thought anything of it. We thought maybe it was kids in the neighborhood, you know, and again, we don't know for sure what it was, but through all the discussions I've heard you know, people having different experiences. I'm like, I wonder if that's what was happening. Um, and then we had bought a doorbell, <laughs> and this is even weirder, that you put on the front of your house. It's a battery. You put a battery in it. And it happened for a couple of years, not every night, but periodically, about, I don't know, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, our doorbell would ring. And we would look out and nobody was there. And we thought something was wrong with our doorbell. We were like, what? <laughs> I mean, 
so these were just some odd experiences that we had in the house. Um, you know, we had something hit the, which I don't, you know, it sounded like something hit the side of our house because something in that bathroom fell, the clock fell. Um, and that was, I don't know, right when we were going to bed, probably about 11 o'clock at night. So. Well, it was later than that. Was it later? Yeah, like right. one, two o'clock in the morning. Well, I know it was late. So, um, so again, I don't know what it was. I'm sometimes I think, gosh, I wish I would have looked out, but then part of me is glad I didn't, because had something been looking at me in the in the window, I don't know what I would have done. I mean, I I would have just probably passed out from <laughs> fright. Um, but I know, right after, not too long after we moved into that house, um, you know. I, my, my husband would say, what are you looking at outside the, the dining room window? Because it was right next to the pasture. And I said, well, I don't, you know, I don't know. And he'd say, well, is someone out there? And I'm, I said, no, no one's out there, I don't think. But I would you know, get this odd feeling like something was looking into the house from out the tree line or something. So I would make sure the blinds were always closed, even though it was the pasture. I would just make sure the blinds were always closed. I would just get this really um, uncomfortable feeling. Um, but I know the couple of times when I was awakened with this horrible smell, I was so scared. Um, I mean, I was frightened um, significantly. And like I said, usually in the home that we had there, um, I, I was never scared. You know, I would have all the lights out when I went to bed and I'd be home by myself all the time and it was no big deal. So it took me a while after those experiences before I felt comfortable enough when I was home alone to turn all the lights out and, you know, stuff. So, um, but again, you know, it never even dawned on us until, um, you know, we would hear about other people's experiences and I would be like, what the heck? I wonder if that's what was occurring at the house. I mean, I have no way to prove it and I I don't know for sure, but it just felt really uncomfortable and scary. And, you know, again, and I, I, what I learned from that is to be, pay more attention to things because like I said, I would just go through things um, not really thinking about it, but now I try to be more aware of my surroundings, um, of what's going on. I mean, what happened to us in Estacada? No, oh, I don't. Did you want to, us to talk about what happened to us in? Yeah, Estacada? I got a. Yeah, let me ask you a quick question though before you get into yeah. the Estacada encounter. Uh, the smell that you smelled, it was it sulfur or can you describe it as far as what what it smelled like it smelled like sulfur um and sewage um i used to live in um, a town in southern california and we call it sulfur springs <laughs> and that's what it, it was in it, it's it's kind of what it smelled like but it was just it was a lot more putrid um I, and like i said when it woke me up i thought i was i i thought you know satan has come into my house i mean that's what it <laughs> felt like yeah i was like what the heck it was just this horrible sulfur sewage smell. Yeah, it's that your guys is the the encounters going on around the home. That's interesting. I talked to a guy who almost similar to what was going on in your home, and he told me he goes, I, th- I think the place is haunted. And I was asking him, well, wh- why is it that you think it's haunted? And he's describing a lot of what you're describing. He said the only thing that's weird is is um, when the ghosts run off. I can hear that there are footsteps. They run and jump off the deck. And I was like, I don't think ghosts run and jump off decks. And so he started looking around the property and he actually found some huge footprints. Uh, But for the longest time, he just thought it was a haunted house because, you know, one, two o'clock in the morning, something would bang on the house or something would knock at the door or he'd hear the door handle kind of shake and he'd go to the door and there's nothing there. And so for the longest time, he thought it was haunted. Uh, but the only one thing he couldn't put his finger on is why the ghost, well, he thought were ghosts, would he'd hear him run off the deck and then jump off and then sound like they went off into the forest. And it's just interesting. Uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. What, what happened in Estacada? 
Um, well, we were staying with Mike's sister, our sis- my sister-in-law for a period of time. This was back in <clears throat> the mid eighties. And we decided to go for a, a walk or a hike that day. It was an, you know, a nice day. And, you know, we walked down the road for a while and then we decided to go through a field. There was a, a fence, a bob wire fence attached to wooden posts. It said no trespassing, but we trespassed. We we went anyway, but we were, you know, we were just out for a walk, just, you know, enjoying nature. And we walked quite a ways. I don't even know how how long and how far and went walking through a wooded area. We came out the other side, a small forest, I want to say. And then we came upon um, a game trail. Game trail was probably about, what, five Six feet wide? Something. It wasn't even that wide. No. Well, it was about four feet wide or something like that. But anyway, when we came upon it, I noticed um, off to my left, there was a dried grass area that was matted down. It was huge. And I've seen areas where, you know, appears where deer lay or something, small area. But this was a, a large area that... I thought, well, maybe a family of deer <laughs> laid down. That's what I was thinking. And then I saw there was a, a tree, a tall tree, and I noticed that it was um, broken at the top. That it, um, had been, you know, broken down. It wasn't off. It was just laying there. And I mentioned to Mike, I said, that's, you know, kind of odd. It's not, it's not a lightning strike. It's not burnt, but it had been broken. And I just thought it was odd and so we continued to walk all of a sudden um, I noticed a huge uh, what appeared to be a human footprint it was extremely large and wide and also at the same time we were hearing an, what it sounded like an owl you know a little ways away which I thought was odd an owl in the middle of the day it just seemed odd to me, and I mentioned that to Mike as well. I, I said, you know, an owl hooting in the middle of the day, it just seemed odd. <clears throat> anyway, I saw the footprint, and I mentioned to Mike, I said, well, what the heck, It's this is huge. What idiot would be up here walking around barefoot in the middle, you know, walking a game trail? In the mud. <laughs> like, and um, it, it just seemed odd. And then I said, well, there has to be shoe prints. They had to have taken their shoes off somewhere. There had to be a shoe print. So I kind of backtracked a little bit and looked, and I didn't see any shoe prints. And again, I'm just thinking this is really odd. Um, we didn't even contemplate uh, Bigfoot. And then a little ways farther down the game trail, saw another print. And I can't remember if we saw two or three. I think there was there was, there was two or three that I remember, but... Um, anyway, so we continued to walk and then we started, and there was also, I could hear a, a, what sounded like a woodpecker. And I mentioned to Mike, do we have woodpeckers in Oregon? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, we've gone camping and, and things like that over the years, but I don't know if there's woodpeckers in Oregon. It just seemed, some things just felt off. And um, anyway, so we continued to walk, and then we started, came um, upon a just horrible smell. We thought something died, and Mike picked up a large stick, and he started poking around the brush, kind of looking to see what he could find, some dead animal. And um, anyway, pretty soon, I just started getting this uncomfortable feeling um, that I just, I told him, I said, I don't. I don't know what it is, but I said, I feel really uncomfortable right now. I said, I, we need to leave. I said, we need to get out of here. I don't know what it is, but we need to leave. And so we, you know, walked a little faster <laughs> and, um, you know, came out the other side. And it was really weird because it didn't seem like it took us very long to come out the other side. And there was um, like a, a highway yeah, right there. The highway. There. The highway. Back there. Yeah, and I I just thought, okay. I mean, I thought we were farther out in the woods than than that. I mean, but yeah, it didn't seem like we walked very much farther, and there was a highway. But 
you know, I just told Mike, I said, something isn't right. We need to get out of here. You know, you just get this really crawly feeling. Was that the same print you guys showed me when we were in Portland? I could have sworn you guys showed me a print. Mm -mm. No. No, we didn't show you a print. Oh, maybe I'm thinking of this one. I know I had emailed you a print that my son took. Oh, maybe that's what it was. Yeah, I sent that to you. uh, Our son goes out mushroom picking. Uh, and he took a picture of um, a print, and I sent that to you a while back. But he's also told me, probably, and it's probably within a 10-mile radius of the house we live in, right? 10, 15-mile radius. 15. 15-mile radius. <clears throat> and he told us that he's found um, nests. Yeah, nests and tree structures and stuff out when he's mushroom picking. And I just always tell him to be really careful when he's out there but he took a picture of the print and i sent it to you a while back yeah maybe that's where i'm getting confused yeah it's tell him to be careful will you <laughs> when he goes out yeah there. Uh, because he you never know what i mean as you both of you guys know you guys know you never know what you're going to run into and if you're out there alone you're very much more vulnerable than uh, if you have a person yeah. with you he'll go out by himself but he he says don't worry i have a gun and what he takes with him is a 22 rifle and I and I tell him, Chip, if if you run into a Bigfoot, don't shoot him with that thing. You you will get killed. I said you. The only thing you're going to do with that is piss some something off. But we were up with him one day and and ran into a tree break and uh, a couple other prints in the moss with, that you couldn't see toes, but you could see where it had broken the moss down. And we were walking all over and never left any kind of a sign in the moss. But there was two uh, side by side that they had found. And uh, we knew there was activity up there because uh, I think we we uh, videotaped a tree break and sent it to you. Uh, but that was the same area that he had found nests and tree structures and stuff up there. Well, I'm thinking of over the years when we've camped and, and things like that, you know, thinking back, you know, I can, re- it seems like I can re- recall time camping and, you know, hearing like, sounded like someone chopping wood in the distance and me making a comment, who'd be chopping wood in the middle of the night, you know? So, you know, thinking back on different things, like camping and, and other things we've done, you just don't think about it. And now, when we do things and we're going out, you know, hiking or, or whatever, I'm more mindful of my surroundings and what's going on because you know, I didn't think about it before. I didn't know. Yeah, it's interesting. Once you start looking into this subject, you, you do think back on a lot of different things that happened to you that you just brushed off or you didn't think that there was anything to it. And it makes you mm-hmm. wonder. It's like the guy was telling you about uh, the same experience you're talking about, Debbie and Mike, the – the home that you guys were in, you know, he was like, I, I swear it's haunted. I'm just lost on why I hear these things were, you know, <laughs> hear these, hear these ghosts run off. And, you know, or uh, the lady I always talk about out in Texas, the older lady that claims there's three big, large black men living on her property that basically torment <laughs> her day and night, you know, year round, uh, throw rocks at her home. And, you know, if you don't believe in Bigfoot or Sasquatch, it, you, you try and make sense of it. You know, you try to, it's got to be three big black guys on my property, right? It can't be anything else, even though that makes no sense at all. Um, right. Yeah. But you, you there try has to, to be another excuse for it. There has to be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You always try and come up yeah. with uh, explanation. And like with the the green little person that you saw, Mike, I mean, sometimes you can't make sense out of things. Sometimes you run into things and you just, it makes no sense at all. It's fascinating. And I, I appreciate you guys. Uh, taking the time to come on and uh, Debbie you talking about all the Bigfoot experiences and, and the different things going on around the home and and Mike thank you for coming on and, and talking about that I know it wasn't the easiest thing in the world and I can't thank you enough for sharing it and I feel honored you did on my show so thank you well you're welcome Mike thank you and you guys have a uh, Merry Christmas and again thanks for coming on all right you too you too what? well next up on the show I want to welcome Frank to the show uh, Frank, thanks for coming on. How are you tonight? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are you doing, Wes? Doing well. Doing well. Thank you so much for being on uh, the Christmas show. 
Uh, Frank, you've lived a very interesting life. I know you're a former Army Ranger. You spent uh, a lot of time out hunting, uh, a lot of time in the woods. Your dad trained you on, on being out in the woods. And, and so you've lived this great life. And I know there's not a whole lot that shakes you up. But you ran into something very interesting on your property out there in Georgia. If you would, kind of start from the beginning. Tell us what you're out doing and then walk us into what happened to you. Okay. Um, it was just uh, a regular night. Uh, wasn't anything special going on. I hadn't been drinking or anything like that. And uh, I actually had my sleep shorts on and my uh, sleep shirt on. And I was just taking my dog out for the last time before we went to bed. Um, it was probably, we get up early in the morning, so it was probably like 9, 9.30 at night. And uh, I had a really big dog. Um, he's a chocolate lab, about 120 pounds, not fat, just really big, and wasn't scared of anything. Uh, we get deer in our backyard all the time. He's always taken off after him, come back like two hours later with his tongue hanging out. And, you know, he, I, I've seen him actually chase foxes. I mean, he just he wasn't afraid of anything. Um, he wasn't a hunting dog. Um, I really don't hunt anymore. Uh, since I got out of the service, but he was a great family dog, wasn't scared of anything, loved to be in the woods. Um, so I was taking him out to go to the bathroom, and uh, it was one of those nights where the moon was, I don't know if it was a total full moon, but it was one of those really crisp, clear nights where the moon was so bright that it almost looked like daylight out or dusk. You could see everything. You didn't need a flashlight or anything like that. So we came out the, came out the front door. And I noticed uh, two doors down, as we came out the front door, my neighbor has a fence around his yard. I don't have one around mine, but he has a fence around his yard, and he has like seven dogs of all different breeds. And they're just going nuts, barking and everything, kind of going off a little bit unusual for them. But I didn't think anything of it because they're always barking. I mean, a stick breaks in the woods, and one of them goes off, they all start going off. So it's something that happens quite often. Didn't think anything of it. Um, So he's to the right of my house and I always take the dog out around the left of the house to the backyard. He knows he can go to the bathroom all he wants in the backyard, just not in the front. So uh, I'm walking them down the side of the house. And what I thought was unusual was as soon as we stepped beyond the back of the house to where my neighbor's dogs could see us, they all immediately stopped barking and were just dead silent. No whip, no whimpering, no like excitement or anything, nothing, just totally quiet. And I thought that was kind of, kind of strange. Didn't really think anything of it. I'm just like, you know, come on, go to the bathroom. I'm ready to go to bed. And, uh, he, on his, uh, house, the way it's built, his back door is on the second floor and he has a deck there, um, that goes all the way around the, the, second floor of his house. And then he has stairs that go down to his uh, backyard. And I happened to glance over and he had his light on, uh, you know, right by the door. And all seven of his dogs are standing up on that deck and they're all staring at me. And uh, I'm kind of like, you know, what are y'all looking at? You know, what's going on? I didn't really think much of it, you know? And I looked down at my dog and my dog was right beside me, totally fixed on something that was, straight ahead of him and he wasn't looking that direction like at first when he was just standing there i thought he was just like looking at them um but he wasn't he was actually looking straight directly in front of me and we used to have a real big uh round trampoline in the backyard and we were probably 20 25 feet from it and he was fixed right where this trampoline was and kind of looked at him and you know i kind of threw a knee into him kind of you know went hey you know, like, come on, let's go. And normally when I do something like that to him, even if he's fixed on an animal or something, he like flinches a little bit or, or at least his ears will either drop down or go up or, or, or something. And it was like, I almost tripped over him because it was like he was a statue. Like he was grounded, like bolted into the ground. Didn't flinch at all one bit. Um, and I noticed that all of the hairs on his back were standing up and more so than I've probably ever seen on a dog in my whole life. And I grew up with all kinds of dogs, mostly Labradors. And I mean, it was all of his hairs, even on top of his head. I mean, it was, 
everything was standing up. He was totally fixed on something. All I could think of, I've never seen him act like that. And so all I could think of was, is there's something right in front of us that he's fixed on. I, I, the only thing I could think of was it must be this monster sized deer that we have around here. And out of 16 years of living here, I've only seen it twice. And both times were on my way to work at about three o'clock in the morning. Um, it's got to be at least a four, 14 pointer. And it's not like um, I know I've seen big deer, like pictures of really big deer like that before. Um, and sometimes the rack looks like too big for their head and stuff. This deer is not like that. He's so big, like, the 14 point rack on him looks good on him. He's that big of a deer. And probably for you guys out there, that's not too unusual, but for this area, a deer that size is pretty unusual. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, that deer has got to be standing right here. And if it's in between me and the trampoline, I've almost got it kind of cornered from the path with the least amount of resistance for him to get away in my backyard. So I, I was thinking, you know, it, it might come after me. I don't, I, I was never really a deer hunter. I was more of a bird hunter. So I didn't know if it was like rutting season or anything like that. Um, so I didn't want to make any sudden moves. Um, so I kept my head down, looking at my dog, trying to see, trying to figure out exactly where he was looking. And I very slowly, kind of put my feet about shoulder width apart, kind of bent my knees a little bit, and I'm moving very slowly, trying not to make anything, any kind of sudden moves, kind of getting myself in like a linebacker's football stance to get ready to protect myself. I kept my head down, and I rotated my eyes up as far as I could to try to see if I could see legs or anything or get a glimpse of exactly where this big deer was. And all I could see was the ground in front of me, which I could see pretty good because of the way the moon was, but it was just totally dark underneath the trampoline. If you've ever seen, like, if you've ever had a trampoline in your yard before, it's just, at night, it's just totally black underneath it. And so that's all I could see. So I couldn't see anything. All I saw was the ground and the, and the blackness underneath the trampoline. And I said, okay, I got to look up. I got to get out of this situation. Um, so I kept my eyes rotated up as hard as far as I could. And I popped my head up and looked straight up. And when I looked straight up, it, it looked almost like a silhouette of myself standing there. And I'm a big guy, but I'm only five, six, but uh, I'm 200 pounds. I was a um, power lifter for many years when I was younger. So I have very wide shoulders I'm kind of funny built, big guy, but short. And it wasn't, if it was taller than me, it was only maybe five, eight, you know, if it was even taller than me at all, but it was just as wide as me. All I saw was silhouette, shoulders, head, um, almost like a, a target. I was in the military back in the early nineties and the, it was like that silhouette target, just the head, shoulders and the torso. And that's all I saw. But the second my eyes, hit it it took off straight to the left and went through the thickest most gnarly little patch of stuff that i have in my backyard and it's the only place i have everything else is open everything else is just pine trees staggered you can run right through them you know they're it, but this one little section it's just like a bunch of little trees that are like almost like big thick vines it's all there's thorns all through there um there i used to throw like when limbs fell down i used to throw them in that just thick patch it just nasty gnarly stuff and this thing crashed straight through that like it wasn't there um very loud and it's only a patch that's probably 30, 40 feet deep, and then it opens up just like the rest of the woods does just on the other side of it. And once it crashed through that, I could hear the footsteps with every footstep it hit. I only heard five footsteps, maybe the sixth one just barely, because by then it had to have been at least 100 yards away from me in the woods. Five steps. When it... <sighs> When my eyes first, when I, my eyes got on it and it first took off, it was literally just a blur. It, it was, it moved that quick from one step full speed. 
and move faster than any animal that, you know, I know a lot about animals. I grew up watching Neutral Omaha's Wild Kingdom, never missed an episode. Um, seeing greyhounds at the track running, no, nothing even comes close to how fast this thing moved in one step. So immediately I'm thinking, it, okay, that's not real. It's not something that's an animal. It's got to be like paranormal. All I saw was a black shadow and a blur. Um, so at this time, this was in 2006. And at this time, uh, the TV show Ghost Hunters, I think it had only been out for maybe a year or two. And there was, I grew up in Central Florida. There was an episode they had where they went to St. Augustine and they went to the lighthouse in St. Augustine. And I was very interested in that because I remember going there in grade school on field trips. And they actually caught footage there of what they called like a black mass ghost. And it was on the stairwell. It was just like a black kind of blurry shadow of like a person. And when it took off, and they had a couple different cameras on it. Um, when it took off, it went up like three landings in like a blink of an eye. And it was just a blur when it took off. And that, to me, in my head, that's what I saw. So after it crashed through and then we couldn't hear it anymore, the dog kind of looked up at me and his eyes almost looked like a pug's eyes. Like his eyes looked like they were almost going to pop out of his head. And I swear if he could talk, he would have said, you know, what was that? Like he, he had that look like I've never seen anything like that before, whatever. And I just was kind of, you know, I just kind of blew it off and I'm like, wow, I just saw something like paranormal. And, but I, uh, the next couple of days, I didn't understand why did I hear it? You know, if it's a black mass, ghost or whatever why did i hear it crash through the woods why did i hear its footsteps it doesn't have to do that it can just you know go right straight through trees or whatever and it doesn't have to make any noise didn't really think anything of it bigfoot never crossed my mind at all whatsoever you know years later i want to say probably 2013 2014 um i was at home alone uh, I think my wife had the kids shopping or something, sitting in the dark, watching stuff on YouTube. Probably watch, I know I was watching something on animals, just obsessed with animals my whole life. Probably watching like funny dogs or something like that. And uh, I'm cooking myself something to eat and I've got the sound turned way up on, you know, we've got like a stereo system connected to a computer and I'm making myself something to eat in the kitchen. And all of a sudden it gets real loud and it's y'all's intro to Sasquatch Chronicles. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, what's that? You know, it was just, it was way louder than anything else that I had been hearing on YouTube. And I start to hear you talk and I finished making my food and I sit down and it's um, you and Woody's episode two about y'all's experience. And I started listening to it and uh, I was totally intrigued. I, I, could, I mean, I was actually like sitting there, like starting to get scared. You know, I'm sitting there in the dark listening to this. And it was almost like I was there just because y'all just described everything so perfect. Um, and it really kind of shook me up. I was sitting there thinking, God, what? I have no idea what I would have done if I would have been in a situation like that. From then on, I was hooked. And I think y'all were probably in the teens at that time in your episodes. And I just started listening to all of them and then been listening every week ever since um sometimes i pass a few weeks because i get upset about the episode quitting so i'll get like three or four episodes in a row so i can just sit down one night and just like listen to a bunch of them <laughs> but uh yeah because i get upset i'm like oh man i want another episode and there's not one there uh but uh you know as time went on i i started realizing that people started saying things that brought me back to this incident I had that started making me go, well, well, yeah, yeah, that's kind of like what I saw and just different little subtle things that different um, guests that you had talking, uh, like the guy saying it just moved impossibly fast. It moved like a ninja. Nothing can move this fast. I mean, that's what this was. It did, impossible speed. There's nothing out there living that can move that fast. That and just um, when the one person was saying that, they were it was so black that it seemed like it absorbed the light well when i saw this thing all i saw was black no shining from the moon on it no shimmering of like on fur nothing just 
total solid black, like almost like it was made of like, almost like it was a black hole, just it, totally black, no, nothing to it. it. And just, you know, like, uh, the, uh, SWAT team guy that was talking about going down the highway at like 75, 80 miles an hour and had one pacing his car. And I'm thinking, yeah, that's, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. At least 80 miles an hour. You know, I'm, um, I, I've been to, uh, Tampa to Bush Gardens and seen cheetahs run. Oh no, this was way faster than that. Um, just impossible speed. So I'm thinking, yeah, 80, 80 plus miles an hour from a standstill one step that fast. So in my mind, it was just, it, it, it's just impossible. But as I started just listening to your shows, just different little subtle things that people were saying, I'm like, well, God, I started thinking maybe that's what I saw. You know, I, I really don't know, but it just seems that as time went on, things just coordinated with what I experienced. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, a lot of witnesses I've had on past shows reminded me of your encounter, actually. Uh, there's one I can think of where a lady, um, she was, I want to say she was in a truck, or maybe the Sasquatch was by a truck. I probably shouldn't have brought this up because I can't remember right off the top of my head. But she, <laughs> it, it took off running. And she said that it was like a black, um, and it moved so fast, it's like it floated away really fast. It, but one thing that she said was interesting is she said, I heard it run off. I heard it take every step and actually run off and crash to the bushes. But the way it mm -hmm. moved did not seem natural. It didn't. There was something odd about how fast it could move. And in her mind, and in a lot of witnesses' mind, you see something that large. I realize the one that you saw it wasn't King Kong. It's still a big animal. Don't get me wrong. Something like that will tear you apart right. in two seconds. But um, right. even to see something of that size and to see how quickly it can move, it's awe-inspiring. It, it makes you realize really quick we're not the biggest, baddest thing out there. And it's interesting, yeah. too, all the dogs uh, shut up. You know, if that would have been a human out there, I used to have a, a lab. I, I love that dog so much. He passed away of cancer. But I love that dog so much. And dogs are funny. They'll either bark, wag their tail. Um, they'll do something. They won't just stand there and look at a person. And the, yeah. the way you described it running off, I mean, there's no way a person could have moved like that. No. Oh, no, 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 no. They're, they're, de one thing I know for sure, definitely not a person with, without question. And definitely not. You know, it moved... I'm telling if it wasn't for and I've thought about this before, if it wasn't for just me being as observant and doing exactly what I did, like if I, if I would have just like realized that he was looking in that direction and I would have just nonchalantly looked up, I, I probably would have never saw it. it. It moved that fast. I probably would have never saw it. it. The only reason why I really think I even saw it at all was because I rotated my eye, kept my head down, rotated my eyes up first as far as I could, and then very quickly raised my head up. And, and I, if, I, I, if I didn't do it like that, I don't think I would have ever even seen it. I would have just heard it. So I, wouldn't have, I would have just probably thought, wow, that was a really fast deer. You know, that's probably what I would have thought. I probably would have never thought anything else of it. Yeah, and the other interesting part about your encounter is the fact that it wasn't super huge. Uh, I'm not saying that they no. can't be that big in, in Georgia, but it's uh, most of the people have had on the show from Georgia, they'll describe them five, six. I think the max I've ever had was someone said they saw one that was seven feet. But generally, they tend to be a little bit smaller for whatever reason, or the reports that I get anyway, or of a smaller, you know, it's not like the Pacific Northwest. I don't think I've ever right. talked to anyone in Georgia that said, hey, it was nine feet tall or 10 feet tall. Most of the reports, and I'm not saying that can't happen. What I'm saying is most of the reports uh, from Georgia is five, six, sometimes seven feet tall. And that seems to be around the max, really, of reports that I get. Uh, one well, thing, I, didn't even, I didn't even realize that, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. When you talk to witnesses from different areas, you start to kind of, you can kind of put the puzzle pieces together as far as what people are seeing and a lot of the behaviors, too. Uh, one thing I thought that was interesting is when you were in the service, uh, you had mentioned you had talked to guys that were like up here in Washington State up at the military base. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mind right. telling that for the audience? Yeah. I'm, you know, 
I don't want the audience to think that, you know, I was a big, bad ranger for a long time. I, I could barely, I thought I was big and bad when I was in high school. I broke a lot of weightlifting records. I was a multi-athlete in many different ways, including like swimming, whitewater boating. I mean, you name it, soccer, everything else. And I thought I was all that until I got into the service and tried to be a ranger and realized, wow, I'm at the bottom echelon of this and I could barely do it. Okay. So I wasn't there for very long. Um, I was only in the Rangers for a little over a month before I, I messed up one of my knees on a, on a night mission, uh, jumping out of an airplane. And, uh, I just physically couldn't do it anymore. Um, but I do remember talking to some guys that were in second Ranger battalion in Washington state, and they had transferred to the East coast to come to third Ranger battalion at Fort Benning, Georgia. And, I remember sitting back and hearing about a couple different guys that saw something in the woods. They wouldn't talk about what they saw, but they were talking about how they saw something in the woods and they swore that they would never go back in the woods any or have anything to do with like the West coast ever again. And that's why they transferred to the East coast. And I actually heard of certain Rangers that just quit the military period just got out and said, I'm not, no, I'm not doing this and just got out. And, you know, you're, um, Rangers are not your typical people that are scared of much. They are, you know, in most people's cases, the top athlete in your high school growing up would maybe have a, I don't know, 40% chance of becoming a Ranger. You know, I mean, you're talking about the, the most endurance people that are not scared of anything that, you know, and you're talking about guys just seeing something and up and quitting. And uh, I never got an explanation of why, what they saw. Um, but I do remember hearing about uh, of quite a few different people that just quit. That was it. They were done. They saw something and they'll never go back out in the woods again. Yeah, I don't think you give yourself enough credit, man. <laughs> I don't think most people... What's the failure rate for becoming an Army Ranger? I'm sure it's extremely high uh, for the amount of people that try oh, out for yeah. it that don't make it. So I think you don't give yourself well, enough credit. Yeah, there's a reason why there's a 65 to 70% dropout rate. And, you know, and most of the people that go there were like me, like, you know, top athletes their whole life want the biggest, toughest challenge that you can get. And, dude, 70%, you know, 65% dropout rate. I mean, that, yeah, it's, it is, they put your body, they're going to find out what you can and can't do. And they're going to find out how far you can push your body before your body can't move anymore. And, and I, I can't only other people, you know, people that are like Navy SEALs, uh, special forces, Delta force, those guys can do unbelievable, amazing things that you, I mean, you're talking, they can run full speed, 10 miles, full tilt. For 10 miles. And, you know, I, I, dude, I can't do that. <laughs> I can't, I can't do that. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it was hard. Enough. I mean, I was, you know, there was an old, uh, I mean, you're probably like around my age. So there was an old commercial years ago where it showed, um, it was an army commercial where it showed all these guys dropping in airborne, dropping in, and it showed them all like picking up their packs and everything and walking up and they walk up to Sarge. Hey, Sarge, you want some coffee? And, and I remember the saying was we do more by 9 a.m. than most people do all day. That is not a joke because by the time, by the time I was eating breakfast at like, you know, eight o'clock, eight 30 in the morning, I was ready for a nap. I was done. I mean, I was smoked and that was just from doing PT in the morning, you know? So it's, yeah, it, it, it is, you know, just your average show that goes, yeah, I want to go in the army and I want to be a ranger. Yeah, you need to second think that, you know, go, go be regular infantry first and get in and get yourself in a really good shape before you start really thinking about doing that. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. And the base they were probably talking about was Fort Lewis. Uh, there's all kinds of reports coming out of Fort Lewis. And I've even talked to a lot of guys off the air that were at Fort Lewis uh, that will tell you all sorts of things out doing night ops and running into running into these things and it's yeah. kind of crazy you know the military doesn't really address it you would think they would at least let their guys know you don't want to talk about it publicly okay we get it 
I mean, you, you know, as far as a cover up goes, we get it. But at least tell the guys right. at the military base, hey, you might run into these things out here. And here's kind of what you can prepare for uh, when you run into them. But they probably were talking about Fort Lewis. I'm telling you, I've had a lot of reports mm-hmm. out of that area. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, I don't know the exact base of Second Ranger Battalion. I mean, I never really was because I knew I was never going to be there. So I didn't really think anything of it. You know, I mean, just I'm, a, I'm an East Coast guy. I've just never really thought about being state I, and i could have i could have been stationed out on the west coast if i wanted to um when i left rangers i pretty much when you're a ranger and you want to change your mos and you want to do something different you pretty much have a choice you can go where you want you know you have that you've earned that luxury to where you know i could have been stationed in a lot of different places um and, and you know i i chose what i chose for my personal uh, things that I wanted to do, um, you know, I wanted to see different countries. So I, I've decided to, to go to a different country, but, you know, just to, just to get free travel, get paid to go to another country and, you know, <laughs> still be in the military and get to blow up stuff, you know, it's fun. So, uh, but yeah, the, I, you know, I never, never Bigfoot never crossed my mind. I never really thought of it. I, I kind of, I did see the Patty uh, film, of course, because I watched nothing but animal stuff growing up as a kid. And I remember seeing the Patty footage, and I never really thought that much of it. Because to me, oh, that's a West Coast animal. How often am I going to be in the West Coast? I'm an East Coast guy. I grew up in Florida, um, stationed in Georgia in two different places uh, in my military career. Um, grew up whitewater boating in North Carolina. I mean, I never really went west in my life, you know, so, uh, sorry, a guy in the Harleys right by. Um, so, you know, I never kind of like, you know, when you're out in the woods, Wes, and you're, you know, whether you're hunting or camping or whatever, how often do you think of alligators? Never. Exactly. <laughs> see, <laughs> see my point? Yeah. <laughs> you, I mean, you know, being in Florida, you know, I'm thinking of alligator. I'm not thinking of, I mean, to me, in my mind, Bigfoot was something out on the West coast. I never had to worry about it here. Yeah. You know, but that's, you know, but things, you know, back in the seventies, you, you didn't have all the, you know, communication and, and technology and things like that. Like you do now. I mean, if you wanted to see a TV show back in the seventies, you better make it when it's on or you're not going to see it. Right. You know, I mean, that, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> it's yeah. funny, Woody. And, uh, I know this is off Bigfoot, but it's funny. Woody and I were just talking about that, you know, like when we were kids, I mean, I even had a little black and white TV when I was a kid and I remember mm-hmm. we had, um, you know, ABC, NBC, you know, he had your four channels that you got, you could watch. And I still remember when come midnight, the television stations went off the air. Uh, They'd always play the national anthem. And you're right. If you wanted to see something, you had to tune in at a certain time to see something. And you might've been able to pick up that fifth channel, but you had to mess with the antenna a lot and maybe put (laughs) like some aluminum foil on it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The good old days. And I never planned on like being on your show or being recorded or anything like that. I, all I really wanted was to talk to somebody that wasn't going to look at me like I'm freaking nuts, you know, like, you know, I'll tell this story to my friends that have known me for years, know what I've done, know my military background. They were in the military. One of my good friends is a Vietnam vet. You know, I mean, we, you, I tell them the story and they're like, how much moonshine were you drinking? And I'm like, no, no, dude, I was dead sober. I wasn't drinking. I, you know, and that's the kind of ridicule I was getting from people that have known me for years. And so I just, I really just wanted, you know, like I said, as I was listening to more and more of your episodes, the more I started like kind of freaking out. And, and I just really wanted to talk to somebody that wasn't going to ridicule me for what I saw. Cause there was no doubt in my mind what I saw and what I experienced. I know what I saw. I just don't know what it was, you know, and it's not that often that I look at something and I don't know what it is, you know, and I try to figure, you know, I've always tried to figure, I mean, I've seen animals where I'm like, what the hell is that? Like, you know, wasn't sure what it was because of the way it was standing or the bush that it was behind. And I never like jumped to conclusions. Like I was like, is that a bear? Is that like, you know, is that like a Florida Panther? Is that it's big? So what is, you know, what is that? I, I, I was always trying to figure out what it is. I never like jumped to conclusions on anything, but man, when I saw this, I mean, it looked it looked like I was looking at my own shadow when I saw it. But the second my eyes hit it, it just, it, it was gone. It just, it, unbel- 
this is, my mind still can't grasp that it was something living. You know, it just um, can't too too fast. It's just too. Let me put you this way: if these things, you know, I've heard you talk about about you know, oh well, if they want you, they can kill you. And I've heard of people like getting chased by them and they're running for their lives and stuff. From what I saw, if something can move like that and it's nine foot tall and it's 500 plus pounds, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to grab you to kill you. It can just run into you. It can just body block you and you're probably going to die from it. And if you don't die from it, you're going to be laying there and wishing you were dead. Yeah. I mean, that it's, it would be getting like hit by a car. Yeah, you're right. Or a big truck. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah, I mean, I mean it, it could ram you. It doesn't have to. It, from what I saw, it doesn't have to put any effort into doing things to us. You know, of course, I've now I've watched different Bigfoot things on TV, and I remember this one like old um, sea captain guy in Alaska, I believe, and he was saying he saw this huge grizzly bear on um, uh, just on like the shoreline, and it got a whiff of something. And just immediately took off. And he was like, oh, what's going on? And then he got a Bigfoot sighting like shortly after that. And I'm thinking, man, if full-size grizzly bears are afraid of these things, what are these people doing going out there looking for these things? Because you have no shot against a grizzly bear if it wants you. And if those things are afraid of them, you're, you're messing with something that you don't have any idea what it can do. And, and it just kind of blows my mind that people go out there trying to get their attention and knocking sticks and going out there and just dying to get, you know, I, dude, I don't want, I don't want to see one. I, I don't want anything to do with them. I, I'm going to leave them alone. The, the, you know, I don't, I don't really believe in, I mean, I understand to prove things, you know, maybe one should be shot so you can prove to everybody that, Hey, these things actually exist. But you know, these guys that are sitting here saying, well, we need to prove they exist so we can protect them. They don't need our protection. They, they don't, they don't need, they don't need anything from us. They, they, they do what they want. They're, they are lords of their domain. If bears are afraid of them and they, anything that can catch a deer with its hand, kill it without, trying it doesn't need our help man. yeah that's true <laughs> we can't even we can't even find them you're telling me we they need our help they don't need our help they, they they just need to be left alone yeah i couldn't agree more i do remember that account you're talking about in alaska where the fisherman did say the uh, grizzly bear ran off and you're right gr- grizzly bears built for one thing and that's killing uh and yep. if, a, if grizzly bear wants you there you can't outrun one you cannot you can't climb a tree and get away from it you can't out swim it uh if it wants you you're you're dead well, Frank, I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing the encounter and and just sharing your thoughts on the subject. Merry Christmas to you, by the way, and happy holidays. Yes, Merry Christmas. I'm going to go in and color with my grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, I'll enjoy them, man. Get out the coloring books. <laughs> yeah, that's good times. Those, those are That's great memories, you know, good times there. Well, thank you again for coming on. I appreciate you being here tonight. Sure, man, not a problem. Hey, y'all keep doing what you're doing. You know, you, you guys really are... Whether people talk to you about it or not, I know there's a lot of people out there that your show is almost like therapy to them. And you guys are taking this approach the right way. And and I hope that you guys keep doing what you're doing because I know whether you hear from the people or not, I know you're helping a lot of people that really need to, to, to listen to these kinds of things to get valid, validation just for their own peace of mind. So uh, God bless, man, and y'all have a Merry Christmas. Thank you, Frank. Well, next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, Chris to the show. He's also known on YouTube under Sooner Sasquatch. Uh, If you get a chance, check out his YouTube page, Sooner Sasquatch. Uh, Chris, welcome to the show. Merry Christmas to you. Yeah, Merry Christmas to you. Uh, I'm a big fan of the show, and uh, thanks for having me on. No, I appreciate you coming on, Chris. You know what was interesting is I know you were big into the paranormal prior to anything Bigfoot related, uh, and you actually grew up in a home that had some strange things that happened in the home. Uh, would you mind going into that before we get into your Bigfoot encounters? Okay. Well, um, as you know, I, I, I grew, um, grew up in Kansas until about the fifth grade. And the house that I lived in uh, in Kansas uh, was severely haunted. 
Um, I mean, we had all sorts of crazy stuff happen in that house. Um, and we didn't live in that house for very long because, uh, it was freaking my parents out and we ended up moving. Um, and my dad worked for the railroad. So, um, that's why we ended up in Oklahoma. Um, and I don't know if you want me to talk about any of the experiences I had in there. Um, yeah, no, I'd love to hear the, I'd love to hear what happened in the home. I realize it's a Bigfoot show and it's not really Bigfoot related, but curiosity yeah. is. I'll just uh, tell you, yeah, I can tell you a couple of the things really quick. Just, just, I mean, two of the things that, that really stick out. We, uh, my brother had, uh, some marbles, uh, you know, back then we didn't have a whole lot of things to play with and he, they had jacks and marbles and stuff. And he kept these, he had these marbles on a, on a mantle above the fireplace. And one night, uh, I was really young, so I don't remember this, but the story that my dad and my brother tells me, these marbles started rolling off this mantle one by one onto the floor. And, you know, they kept, you know, they checked it out and was trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, make a long story short, my dad went and got a level to see what, you know, if maybe this mantle was just unlevel and, and stuff was, was rolling off because it was kind of, before this happened, stuff was always freaked. You know, there was stuff that was happening that was freaking him out. And so he got curious, he got a level and looked, and this mantle actually went, these marbles were rolling uphill and falling off the other end. Um, that's, that's one of the stories that sticks out. Another one is my dad was a, um, he worked a day job, and then he also was a security guard at night for a department store. And uh, my mom's room was upstairs. Um, it was a big house and uh, had a, a you know, full-size basement. And she would hear um, at night, late at night, uh, there was a door at the bottom of the stairs, and she would hear the door open and footsteps coming up the stairs. And she thought maybe it was my dad could getting off work early and coming home. She'd go out the bedroom door, look down the stairs, and there's nobody there. And this happened one night. She said it happened two or three times in a row. She grabbed all his kids and went to a hotel because um, she'd had enough. Um, but that's just a couple of the things that happened in the house. And we, after that happened, um, we went to another house and I used to have nightmares in that house and it, and it really kind of, uh, I had night terrors for a long time and it kind of, kind of disturbed me. And then, uh, we moved to a different house and, um, after that things kind of got better. But as I grew up, I, you know, I kept hearing those stories and I could remember bits and pieces of things happening in that house. Like we had a cat that would go down in the basement and just stare into the corner and hiss. Like nothing, there was nothing there. That's one of the things I remember as a kid. Um, but anyway, that's what got me interested in the paranormal. And uh, so, like I said, I moved to uh, a little town called Mustang that's southwest of Oklahoma City. Um, and I joined a paranormal group there, um, went on several ghost hunts. And I kind of got bored with that. You know, you can only do so much with that, I guess. And I moved out to Port Supply which is in northwestern Oklahoma. And I've been out here for about seven years. And I met a girl from the town that I grew up with, or uh, from the town that I grew up in, in uh, Mus that little town called Mustang. And uh, we were spending a lot of time together. Even though I lived out here, I would visit her quite often. And uh, we were trying, was trying to find things to do together. I, I was a real outdoorsy guy. I liked to fish and hunt. And she wanted to, you know, part participate in anything I did outdoors. We like to go camping and stuff. So, um, I already had a, uh, like hunting gear and camping gear. Um, so we went and bought her some hiking, hiking gear, some boots and some camo pants and stuff like that. We would go on hikes together. I, I don't know if, are you familiar with the El Reno chicken man incident? I am. I am. Yeah, you are. Okay. Well, um, <clears throat> I'll get to that here in a minute, but some of the areas that we would go to were near that area where this the El Reno it was actually east of El Reno in between El Reno and Oklahoma City Oklahoma City the North Canadian River and the South Canadian River are the two major river systems that run all the way through Oklahoma and that's where that the El Reno chicken man uh, took place was along that river anyway we would hike in uh certain areas along this river and we come across one day we come across this huge uh stick structure i mean this thing was humongous and there's a picture of it on my facebook page it's it's when you if you go to my chris dickinson my facebook page you'll see it it's there at the top uh it's a huge hut structure 
And, you know, we were kind of thinking maybe it was a hobo structure or something like that. Um, there was a little bit of trash in it. I will, I will say that, um, that it wasn't like it, it did kind of freak us out walking up to it, but there really wasn't a whole lot of sign of people using it. So that kind of piqued my interest. And, um, you know, I, I, I knew about, you know, I'd watch the TV shows, you know, about Bigfoot and all that, but I always, you know, I, I never really gave it two thoughts. I always thought, never really thought that, you know, Bigfoot was a real thing. I wanted it to be, you know, because I, I mean, it was anything like that. It really interested me. But when we found that structure, that's when I started doing my research online, watching, oh, I watched tons of YouTube videos, was looking up. That's when I found the BFRO, uh, started looking up sightings in Oklahoma. And, you know, when I first started, I looking at these sightings, I thought they were all down in southeastern Oklahoma. Well, then I started doing more digging deeper, and there were little sightings all over Oklahoma. Now, where I live up in northwestern Oklahoma, and I don't mind giving out the location unless you don't want me to. No, it's up to you. It's completely up to you. Okay. I live at a lake. I'll just put it that way, in, in northwestern Oklahoma. And uh, it's really dry and arid up here. I mean, some of the some of the um, it's, it's almost desert like in some areas. The only places there's trees and forest is where there's bodies of water, like the river or lakes or creeks. Everything else has been cleared cut for farming. So we would do most of our our hiking, you know, there along that Canadian River near El Reno. So um, do you want me to go ahead and jump into my first sighting? Yeah, if you would. Yep. Okay. This was um, probably three or four miles east of where the El Reno Chicken Man incident took place, and and I'm sure most most of the listeners probably know know of that. If yeah, if you I, don't, you can you can look it up. Yeah, I think I did a show on it. I think I had the neighbor of the guy of the El Reno how the whole thing got started. I think I had the neighbor on the yeah. show. It was a while back in the fifties, but. Um, I thought I thought you had did a show on it, but I, I wasn't one hundred percent sure on that. But anyway, um, that's where we we started doing a lot of our hikes was a, along that area. We we had my first encounter. We had been hiking uh, one day, and it was it was pretty. It was early, early spring. This is in two thousand fifteen. We was pretty much done. Um, she had already headed back to the to the vehicle. Uh, or was headed back to the vehicle, and we we was getting activity all around us. We could hear stuff in the trees all around us. We was actually down in a uh, a tributary of the North Canyon River. It was a creek that feeds into that, and uh, we could hear stuff all around us. But we kept thinking maybe it was just deer or something like that. And she was headed back to the car. And in that first video, I'm using my cell phone, and it's kind of hard to see because I wasn't holding the phone the way you're supposed to when you're recording. I was, you know, was holding it upright, so it's got the black bars on the side. I, I was in this creek bed, and I could hear something walking, you know, kind of or moving around up in the brush, but I could never see anything. So uh, I'm in the video towards the end. You can see me. I'm I'm not narrating or anything because this is, you know, I didn't expect to get anything on video. It's my first video. Uh, I, I panned to the left and as I panned, I, I locked eyes with now, <clears throat> this is what was creepy because when I first saw it, I got the impression of an, of a little old man. This thing was, uh, about four feet tall and it had, it, it had really long hair, but the hair was like. In Oklahoma, we have we have a lot of clay, and the clay is either red or it's like a like what what you would normally think clay is like a tannish brownish color or grayish color, and that's what this thing was. Uh, that's what the color was. It almost you know once I looked once I thought about it, I, it looked like a juvenile that maybe had been rolling around in the mud, like its hair was covered in that gray that grayish color because it. And it could have been the way the sun was hitting it through the trees, but it had a grayish look. But it was only about four, five feet tall at the most. And when I turned and locked eyes with it, um, I'm still recording with my phone. But as I'm turning, I'm I've got my hand on the on the uh, the stop button button to stop recording. 
because you know I didn't I didn't know that I was capturing this, and I hit the st- and I and I hit it as I'm turning, and at, right at that same time I lock eyes with this thing and it takes off through the trees, and it made all sorts of racket taking off. I mean breaking, snapping limbs. You know, of course it freaked me out, and I took off, and I didn't I didn't think that I'd even got got it on film. I, I really didn't think that I did, and I get back to the car and. You know, I'm telling uh, telling her what happened, and I pulled out the phone and went went over it, and I was like, "Well, I can't believe it. I actually, I actually got it." And you can see it there. I mean, you can see it in the trees. You can kind of see it. Uh, you can it's it's kind of tree peeking. You can see it. You can see it move off a little bit, but you don't see it. You know, I, I had cut the camera off before you could see it run off, and. Can you just, I wanted to go back and look for prints, but I was so freaked out about it that I that I didn't. And thinking that it was uh, maybe a a juvenile, that there was going to be you know adults around, and so we left the area. Chris, can you describe the face as far as what you actually saw? Well, <clears throat> all I it had a, the the hair on it. Now it did have the cone a cone shaped head. But all I, the face, the hair was covering, I mean, it had really long hair. So all I could really make out was the eyes. I mean, it wasn't really that close to me, um, but I could make out the black. It had really big black eyes. Um, I couldn't tell if there was any ears. And it happened so fast that I couldn't really get any details. But I did see eyes, and I could see the color of the, the hair and how long it was. You could see the the arms and it just it turned around spun around and took off i mean it was lightning quick so i didn't really get very many details out of that one yeah no, um, and that's terrifying man when you when you are especially when i guess you're never really expecting it even when you people go out now like yourself chris uh, investor investigators go out you're never really prepared to see it again i mean you try your best to be as prepared as possible but even when you see it again right you're never really uh, i've talked to investigators researchers who uh, have been doing this for many many years though i had one guy who, who saw one walk across the trail right in front of him he had a camera in his hand he's been doing this forever and didn't think to yeah. snap a picture and so it's uh <laughs> you know and and some people they have a hard time with that but you know go walk in that person's shoes and then tell me you're going to snap a picture and uh you know exactly I, I definitely get where you're coming from. What, what did your girlfriend think when you went back and told her, hey, I saw something and it <clears throat> freaked out and ran off? Uh, well, you know, she she's the type that she believed me. And when when I showed her the, you know, we went back over the cell phone footage and she was like, wow, you actually do have something there. Um, she's always been really supportive. I mean, she she's, I mean, she's right there along. I wish she could have been there, you know, and seen what I did. Now with that sighting, it didn't really confirm anything for me. I don't that that may, that might sound weird, but it happened so quick. And even though I did get something on camera, you know, it wasn't satisfied. It didn't satisfy me. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it does. It makes a lot of but, sense. Did you guys keep going back to this area? Is that where you had other yes. sightings? Yes, we actually. Um, let's see. It would have been uh, later that, and it was still in 2015. Later that. Uh, it would have been, it was, I, I remember it was cold. Um, so it, it was probably either, it was probably around fall. I, I don't think it was like winter. It wasn't freezing temperatures, but it was cold. Um, we, uh, we went back and we took a tent. It wasn't the exact same area. It was probably within a mile or two of where that, that first sighting happened. But we set up a tent and, uh, what, what we had, what we had done is we set up the tent and then we went and and investigated another area and her house from this, from where this location is, is probably about 15 miles, 20 miles. So we, what we did is we went and we, we hiked another area for, for three or four hours. We, We had already had the tent set up and we was exhausted and sweaty. So we went back to her house and, and this was kind of the plan anyway. We, we wasn't wanting to stay in that tent all night. But we, what we wanted to do was go sit in that tent till morning and listen, just, just sit real quiet and listen to see, just listen to the sounds overnight. And 
Uh, we had a, one of those little buddy propane heaters in there to keep us warm. Um, so we went back to her house. We showered. We rested for a little bit. And I think we got back to the tent um, a little after it was a little after midnight. I'm going to say it was about 1 o'clock. We get in this tent, and I didn't – now, I didn't have any recording equipment with me, no cameras. The only thing I did have was a game camera. And what my plan was was to set this game camera up just outside the tent, you know, facing away. I had it on a monopod that you could, you know, you could jam it in the ground. And then that way, if anything walked up on the tent, it'd snap a picture. Well, we get in the tent, and we we start hearing stuff right away. We The first thing that stuck out was we we have these owls that – the owls in Oklahoma are, are – are huge and they do this uh they most of them do this call it goes and there was two of them they were they were like these two owls and they were loud they were communicating back and forth we could tell there's two of them well then this third one goes off and it's like you know the 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 first two are doing the exact same call back and forth the the third one goes it was like way off and she's like well that must be the special owl <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and you know it, it didn't make sense until later on that that was probably not an owl because it, it was way off well it wasn't long after these owls were going off and then they they, they kind of, they everything went quiet i mean dead quiet we're hearing all these sounds so my mind didn't think about setting that camera out you know, and, and, and that really makes me aggravated that I didn't do it, but I might not have got the experience that I did if I had that camera setting out there from what I've heard from different researchers. We start hearing uh, footsteps, you know, come, getting closer, and, and it sounds like what it's doing is it's not walking straight towards the tent. It's zigzagging, like it'll go to the right for about five or ten steps, stop, then go to the left five or 10 steps stop and it was getting progressively closer so she's starting to freak out she's like what in the hell is that and you know i'm i'm thinking maybe it could just be a, a person you know maybe we're on someone's someone's land that we're not supposed to be i mean because we're on the we're we're pretty much right on the river this thing gets i'm gonna say it gets within 20 to 30 feet of the of the tent and I'm like, I don't, you know, I want to, I wanted to just, what I wanted to do is say, we're over here or, uh, who's out there or something. But I was like, you know, I was kind of frozen. So I, what I was going to do was I was going to grab a flashlight because we had no lights on the tent. We had, a, what we had was a little, uh, like a battery powered glow stick for light if we needed it. I mean, we had flashlights, but we wasn't using them. We had it completely dark in there. So I'm, but I'm, I tell her, I'm, we're whispering the whole time. I'm like, I'm going to grab a flashlight and I'm going to unzip this tent and see what that is. So I, so as I'm reaching over to grab the flashlight, the bottom of the tent's like that really hard plastic and it crinkles when you move it. Well, it crinkled whenever my knee pushed down on it and it t this thing took off and it was bipedal footsteps pounding the ground like boom 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 take taking off and what was really weird when it was sneaking up to us you know it wasn't heavy footsteps you could hear the footsteps but it wasn't heavy but when it took off you could definitely hear those well uh she was so freaked out she didn't she didn't know if we should leave right then she she wanted to leave right then but she couldn't get out of the tent so we waited um we sat in there with the lights on, we turn on all our lights and we laid down and waited until, you know, just before the, well, it was, it was, the sun was coming up, but it was really, it was still pretty dark. When, when we knew, when we knew the sun was coming up, we got out, we took down the tent and we got out of there. So that was the second encounter. Um, and we did look for, uh, for, for some prints or I did, she was just trying to, she wanted to get the heck out of there. I didn't, I didn't find I didn't find anything, you know, that was real convincing. I could, I could see where some leaves and stuff was, was disturbed. 
like from maybe where it took off, but I didn't find any prints. Yeah, it's interesting. I know when I was in Texas, I would hear that. You would hear what sounds like owls uh, doing calls back and forth. And when I first yeah. got there, I was kind of arguing with the guys. So I was like, it's just an owl call. It's just a bunch of owls. And then the more yeah. we sat and listened to them, they the, the weird thing about it is they would do an owl call and then it would break off towards the end and actually sound like a chimpanzee. Uh, or you would hear oh, wow. the, you would hear the owl call, and then all of a sudden it would get really deep, like it was an eight hundred pound owl doing it. And so it was it yeah. was odd. It was really really odd. Uh, this area that you go to is that where you're having most of your encounters? Is in this one area? Well, the, the, those first two. Now, when I get into my third sighting, uh, like I said, I live in northwestern Oklahoma, and I live by a lake. And I had, you know, I really didn't think that there was anything up here where I'm at. Yeah, the, it's, it's, the forest around this lake is really thick. But like I said, it's so arid and dry up here. And most of the, most of the, I mean, from all the research that I did online, all the sightings. Now, there's sightings all over the state, but there hasn't been any where I'm at documented. There has been some uh, west of here in Texas, like around the Amarillo area and then east of here. Most of the sightings are in, in South Central and then Southeastern Oklahoma. Well, all over Eastern Oklahoma. I didn't really think there was anything up here. But uh, when she would come out to visit me out here, we would we would camp out of the lake and, and do hikes out here also. Well, we came across the footprint one time, and this thing was big. I don't remember the exact measurements on it, but it was big. When I when I found that footprint, I was like, okay, well. That's interesting. Maybe, maybe there could be something out here. And she was open minded the whole time. She was like, "Oh, I, th- this is some thick forest. I, I, I almost bet you they're out here." Well, I, I didn't think so. So we would get deeper in the, into the forest around this lake, and we fa- started finding. Uh, we we found a couple more prints in different places, and then I we started finding those structures again. And I found a total of about, you know. Well, I found multiple out here, but really good ones I've found about four or five. And a couple of them I thought maybe could have been hunting blinds because there is wildlife management areas out here where people, where people hunt. And I thought maybe that's, you know, that could be what a couple of them are. But the other ones are in the middle of nowhere where nobody goes. I mean, deep in the woods. So after finding all that, I'm like, okay, maybe they are out here. So, um, that's when we, we really started, we would come, she would come out uh, cause I wanted to know. So she came out, she'd come out here more often and we'd set up tents on the opposite side of the lake from, from where we was kind of doing our research and, uh, the side of the lake that we, we was researching. Um, like I said, there's a WMA there, wildlife management area. So there's, there is hunting in there in some areas. This encounter would be, uh, this was in uh, the, this year, so it was, it, you know, early, I want to say it was early spring. We had been, we'd been hiking all day, and I, the encounter happened about, oh, about two or three o'clock. So we'd been hiking all, all that morning, and we was kind of tired. So I, was, I decided that this area that I found looked like a really active area. I mean, there were some structures in there. This is it was an area that I'd found prints in before, and there's a creek that runs through there. And I wanted to set up a camera, um, just a static camera, pointing across this creek to an area. I just had a feeling about it. So we go we go over to this to this area to set up this camera, and she's about oh twenty feet away from me, fifteen twenty feet away from me. And I said, I'm going to do some tree knocks while you're setting up, up that camera to try to draw something in and then we'll leave. And that camera will record for about two hours. I've done this before. I've recorded, just set up a static camera, let it record for two hours, come back and get it. I've actually gotten wildlife walked right in front of it, like bobcats and I've gotten some really neat stuff, but I haven't, I haven't gotten any, any Bigfoot on, you know, doing that, but you know, you never know. So and it and it's really fun to go back over those videos. I mean, I know it's just sitting and pointing in one one direction, but you know it's 
watching those videos, you're so excited, just waiting for something to walk by. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, she's setting up this camera, and I'm I've got a, a stick, and I'm whacking on this tree, just bam, 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 bam. And I, I did have a phone in my hand that had a camera on it, and I'm scanning the tree line as she's setting up this camera. Right in front of me, probably, I'm going to say within 20 yards of me, 20 or 30 yards, not probably not even that. I'm I'm gonna say 15 yards. There, a red one, red Sasquatch. All I see is now this encounter lasted. It's a visual encounter, lasts about six seconds. And what I see is, he, it was red in color. I'll just go ahead and describe it for you. It was red in color. Now it didn't have the cone-shaped head like the first one I saw. It was more of a rounded head. And and I've looked up some. I was gonna send you some pictures because I found some pictures on. I was looking up some pictures of uh, orangutans in uh, online, and there was one that kind of that kind of looked like what I saw. But it, it's the one, it's the one that has. If you look at its hair, it's got it's kind of it's got a rounded head, but its hair is has a perfect circle around its eyes. Like and then there's it's just bare skin around its eyes. And, it, and the hair on this thing looked like it was almost, I mean, it was so perfect. It almost looked like it was combed. Like, I mean, it, it looked, the, the, the hair on this thing was immaculate. It was a beautiful creature. But what I remember the most is, just like the first one, big googly eyes. I didn't think about this until after I've listened to your show. People talk about the Down syndrome look. That's what I got from this. Had big googly eyes, had that kind of Down syndrome look. And I could see the head, the shoulders, and a little bit of the arms. And what it was doing for the six seconds I saw it, it was uh, it was doing like this, uh, like bobbing and weaving. Like it was like up and down and left and right. Like it was like uh, looking through the tree, the branches, because it was kind of behind a, a big fallen tree. And then there was a bunch of you know trees in front of it. And it was it was like curious like it was just checking me out like who who in the heck's doing these tree knocks you know it was kind of it had a confused look on its face like why are you knocking on that tree and it was just you know it was like i wasn't scared i had i had no feeling of like oh no this thing's gonna kill me you know it was like i was completely comfortable this thing it was just checking me out now it didn't look humongous this thing actually looked it didn't it didn't look that big I would say out from where it was looking through the trees, I would estimate about six foot tall, maybe, maybe a little more. Um, but it, like, like I said, it was doing that bobbing and weaving thing, looking at me. It lasted about six seconds. And I turned to her to get her attention. I'm like, babe, babe. And she, she can't hear me because she's, you know, she's about 20 feet away from me. And she's setting up this camera that's going the opposite direction. And when I turn back to look at this thing, it's gone. Now, this thing just disappeared. I mean, it didn't make any noise as it left. I didn't see where it went. I ran over and grabbed her. I said, I just saw one. We need to get over here to where it was at. We went. I mean, it just disappeared. Gone. No trace of it. Didn't hear it. Didn't see it move off. Nothing. And But that, I, I got a good look at that one. It had a little bitty ears. It had uh, kind of a flattened nose, like a pudgy flattened nose. Um, the eyes are what I remember the most. Big, googly-looking eyes in that Down syndrome look. But I'll, I'll try to find that picture that I that I pulled up because it looked kind of like this orangutan, this orange or red orangutan that I found online. The face kind of looked like that, and the and the hair did too. But it was a reddish color. So that was my that was my third encounter. And that's interesting. You know, I had a witness on, I can't remember what episode it was, but the witness was saying it moved like a crackhead. Uh, and I was like, yeah. well, what do you mean it moved like <laughs> yeah. a crackhead? And she said, you know, like someone on meth is, and, and I can't remember if it was a female or male I had on now. I apologize. They're probably listening. Uh, I'd have to go back and listen to the show. But uh, I remember the witness saying it moved, it was bobbing up and down and looking around, almost like you'd see someone on drugs fast movements, real quick movements, looking at you, looking away, yeah. looking back. And that's how the witness described it, like a crackhead. It moved around like a Yeah, you 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 had a you had a uh 
somebody on, and I can't remember what episode it was, but they, they described the eyes as uh, twitchy, like they would twitch, like, like a bird, like a bird's eye, like it, how it twitches. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. I remember that. And then this thing was, that's how it was moving too. Just like you said, like a crack it was twitchy. It was like, I mean, it, like it was, but it, it just seemed like it was really curious as to what I was doing. And, and I, and I wasn't, like I said, I, I wasn't frightened. I wasn't scared. I was, it was a total relaxing encounter. And, you know, after that happened, we went back, she set up the camera, we left it there. We went back to our tent. Well, actually before we, she set up the camera and we went to the vehicle and I just sat there and she's like, what's wrong? And I'm like, I can't believe I just actually had that encounter. I can't believe I just saw that. You know, it was like, it was like, I just hit the lottery. I mean, everything that I've been working for, for the last couple of years, came true. I wanted to see it, you know? And I told her, I was like, I don't even care if I get it on camera now. I know these things are real. I just saw one. <laughs> yeah. I was satisfied for a long time after, after seeing that. Um, but that, that kind of wore off and now I'm, now I'm gung ho getting it on camera again. So. <laughs> and so that one that you saw, you would, you would say it looked more animal like more, more primate, non-human primate. Yes. Yeah. Right more animal like yeah and that's interesting that's interesting I mean, it's interesting too you haven't really had any major aggressive type encounters it seems like most of the encounters i've had that have come out of oklahoma have been pretty aggressive encounters they seem like very territorial in that area and that's interesting yeah. that you haven't you realize not every encounter is going to be the same uh, but it's interesting yeah. that they really haven't been uh, aggressive with you. And the other thing too, I like about what you do, Chris, and I always tell people this too, if you don't buy into listening to people's encounters, if you don't believe that, if you don't buy into the track cast, if you don't buy into uh, the hair and, you know, every, the Native American legends and all, you know, everything right. entailed with this, go out in the forest, go, go spend yeah. some time hiking, go spend some time camping, go, and I'm not talking about a campground, Go spend some time out in the woods, and you'd be amazed what you would come across. I think most people would be shocked oh, what yeah. they come across. Exactly, exactly. It, it's uh, you know, I, I get kind of bored telling my. I don't. I really don't even like telling my encounters. I, I get bored with telling it. I, I love hearing other people's encounters. I, I that's. I love your show. I love. I mean. It's a nightly ritual for me to, as I'm going to bed, I'll put on a show and listen to it because I love hearing about other people's encounters. But, yeah, I wanted to come on and, and at least give you what happened to me. And and I didn't even tell you my fourth one. I had one. Uh, this one was pretty amazing, too. But um, it hap once again, it happened so fast. This was just about three weeks ago. Uh, I was driving, and there's a creek that f flows into this lake out here. And I've, it's got a name. I won't give the name, the official name, because you can look it up on a map, but I have nicknamed it Bigfoot Creek because I've had so much activity in there. But I was driving and there's a bridge. There's a, well, there's a, there's a dirt road and there's a bend in this road. And when you come around this bend, there's a bridge that goes over Bigfoot Creek. What had happened is I was actually on a service call for my, for my job and I was coming back from another town and I was coming a lot of times what I'll do is I'll come down this road because there's all sorts of wildlife, deer, turkey, all, they're always crossing this road. And so, I, you know, I'll come, I'll come down this road and then stop by the house and then head to the shop. And that's what I was doing. And as I come up to this bridge, I see what I thought was a hunter uh, standing up on this bridge off the side of the road. Um, cause it, and it looked like it was big. Why I thought it was a hunter is because when you, well, Hunter puts on all their apparel. They look big and bulky, you know, camouflage, your camouflage coat and pants and all that. And that's what I thought it was. So, and as I got closer, I could see that this, that it was a lot bigger than what I, than what a hunter would be. And it was hunched over and why it was hunched over. I don't know, but the, the second I start pulling the truck over and, and to the side of the road. And as I'm pulling up to this bridge, this thing takes off down into the creek. So I jump out of the truck. This was really stupid of me. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to admit this was really dumb. I jump out of the truck and I'm scrambling to get my phone camera on. I turn it on and I run in after this thing. <laughs> 
and then, and it's and of course it's gone. And uh, I did find some some prints down in the creek, um, but they didn't look like solid prints. It almost looked like like toe, like it was digging into the like it, just the front of its feet were digging in because it wasn't a full print. It was really weird. And this thing, it ran on it ran upright the whole time. I could see it running off as you know I'm I'm watching it and then looking down at my phone as I'm as I'm getting out of the truck and wa- running. To, you know to, to get down in there and it's running upright and it gets down in the creek and then when it gets up to the other side of the creek it goes down on all fours and it's gone and i and i run in there after it to where it went up on the other side of the creek and i'm videoing the whole time and it's just gone but that was my that just happened about three weeks ago were you able to get any and of it on, had were you able to get any well, of it on video no uh now i now i have a friend she says that she uh she went through it and she could see something as I'm running. She could see something in one of the frames. She was going through it frame by frame. There's something in the creek. Looks like there's something in the creek. In the next frame, it's gone. You can't really tell what it is. It does look like an upright fi- figure that could be running. I told her, "Good job. That's. I mean, that's an awesome catch." Because I mean, I don't. I don't have. I do have a laptop, but I don't have the equipment to, to kind of do what she was doing. I'll, I'll try to get that picture and send it to you. Um, see what you think about it. I, I can't say conclusively that's what it was, but no, I didn't get any good video of it. I mean, and it was afterward, it was really, I was so out of breath too in the video. It, it's on my YouTube channel. I, w- I wasn't going to post it cause I was kind of embarrassed. I mean, it was really dumb of me to chase it off, chase it in there. <laughs> and this one, <laughs> yeah, be careful. First chasing one them, was a, what are you going to do if you catch yeah. one? <laughs> <laughs> but this one was a, was a darker Brown. When I what what was weird is when it was standing on the side of the road, I got it almost looked green, like uh, it had a hint of green, and it, and that's why I kind of not the whole thing, but just parts of it looked kind of like there was some green in it, and it might have been the way the sun was in it, and that's what threw me off thinking it was a hunter. But as it ran down in the creek, and the trees kind of shadowed it a little bit, it changed. I could see it was a dark brown. I, I don't know. It was really weird when I first, I got hints of green when I first saw it. So anyway. Um, no, that's, that's interesting. That's, you know, being a, a paranormal guy, have you ever had anything strange happen out there? Whether it's Sasquatch related or not, just anything weird happen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I have a digital audio recorder now, but before that, um, before I, I have a lot of equipment now, I have a parabolic mic and, night vision and i have a lot of stuff now but before i had all this equipment i had some old uh tape recorders just the old-fashioned tape recorders and i had two of them i would set those in different places of the forest and just try to you know they wouldn't record for very long you know maybe well they some of sometimes they'd record for four or five hours i mean until the battery died or the tape took up but uh there was one night i had I had one of the recorders sitting way off in the in the forest. I mean, there's no one going out there. And you hear a, you can hear you can hear me uh well I hit record and you can hear me walk off and and she was with me, this girlfriend of mine, um slash slash researcher. Uh we're no longer together now, but we're we're still in touch, but anyway, she was with me. You could hear us talking as we walked off and then in the distance, you could hear faintly. You could hear my pickup. It had my, it had the Flowmaster, so you could hear it start up and drive off. About an hour and a half to two hours after we leave, you hear a, a conversation between two women. Like you couldn't, you could pick out words here and there, but not really, if that makes sense. And that lasted for about oh. Five or ten minutes, you could hear them talking back and forth, and then it just was gone. But it sounded like two women talking. That's yeah, odd. But that's that's really odd. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When I was going over that, it kind of freaked me out. I was like, "Whoa, what?" And, I, and she listened to it, and she's like, "That is." I mean, it was weird because you could, you could hear from when we li- when we left. I mean, uh, we've gotten sounds. It sounds like um, like. Uh, there, Oklahoma has a lot of Indian reservations, and there was one tape I had. It sounded like Indian drumming, like 
you could hear drumming off in the back, off in the distance, and on one of the tapes, that's all you could hear. Um, but yeah, there's been some weird stuff happening out here. You never know what you're going to run into. It's like when I had Jonathan Odom on, and he was talking about. Um, uh, well, he went into a lot of weird things, like the sky quake that happened to him. But uh, seeing the old cowboy uh, up on the hill next. Oh to his, yeah, yeah, where he's talking about that, and you know, and then he pans back and it's gone. And there's mm -hmm. other things you can run in, into out there in the forest, not just Sasquatch related. I mean, there's a lot of weird, you know, these lights that sometimes people talk about. Uh, I've seen them myself. You run into those. And uh, so there's a lot yeah. of weird things you can definitely run into in the woods. I mean, and I have some friends that are all into the woo factor of it, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open minded to it. I'm not going to say I 100% believe in all that, all that stuff, but I had to be open minded to finding these creatures and I did and they're there. So I'm open minded to that stuff. I mean, I'm not going to say that it ha that it's that all that mind speak and that they can go through portals and all that stuff. I'm not going to say that happens, but I'm open minded to it. Um but like you said, I I've I've heard from a lot of people they see those those lights or orbs off in the trees. And Jonathan Jonathan's a good friend of mine. He actually he wants to fly me out to uh, Alabama to do some research with him, and I may do that here sometime soon. He's a he's a really good guy. Yeah, I enjoyed having but, him on uh, the show. But you're right, you know, with the uh, odd stuff, you know, and it may not be Sasquatch related. I don't know what your religious views are. It could be demonic. It could be a lot of different things that it could be. You know, right. you can't throw everything all in one box and say, "Well, here you go. Here, you know, Sasquatch does this and this yeah. and this and this." You know, there's right a lot of correlations when you start hearing a lot of the woo uh, stuff that these people talk about. If you listen to demonic encounters and the woo people hate it when I say this, but if you listen to a lot of demonic encounters and even a little bit of these alien abduction type encounters, there's a lot of coincidences between what they're talking about and these demonic poltergeist type encounters and these yeah. alien abduction encounters. You got your mind speak you know, a lot of the stuff that they talk about uh, is kind of across the board with some of these other yeah. things. Now, I'm not saying that Sasquatch does that, but maybe they're running into something demonic out there. You know, who knows? Yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, like that Dave, David Polites, I mean, I got sucked into that. That I listened to a lot of stuff he talked about. And that, I mean, some of that stuff is creepy. Like, I mean, you could that what 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 park is it? Not Yellowstone. Uh Yosemite, Yosemite yeah. has the biggest cluster of missing people. I'm like, man, there's no way you could pay me to go hike in there by myself, like what I do out here in Oklahoma. <laughs> I would have to have two or three people with me there. Uh, yeah, even look up yeah. the uh, missing Texas 40. That's closer to where you're at. He, I mean, oh yeah, Bob Garrett. Yeah, he, all that stuff that's happening to him is, and and I don't know Bob, but from what I've heard and listened, you know. To, to him talking stuff he seems like a really really nice guy but that stuff that's happening to him is is crazy i mean and and i've heard you ask about government cover-ups i mean I, I i truly think well i mean i i think us that are in the know we know that the government's covering it up and and then to get on you know i, I hear a lot of your listeners say well we need to shoot one well yeah i mean you could shoot one but here's my here's my take on that you shoot one, and I think there have been some shot. I, I think there has been some shot. You shoot one, and it goes and it gets out that you shot one. The government's going to come take it. So I don't think that's really going to solve anything. I mean, maybe, maybe it will. Maybe, but but you know, I mean, you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. No, I, I think that's exactly what would happen. I think it depends on yeah. how someone handled it. I think if you run down yeah. to the news station, it'll never make the news, <laughs> and they're gonna. Come take it from you. I think if yeah. you took pictures and you, um, I think if you released it through, but let's face it, sh social media is more powerful than uh, your mainstream media. It just is. I mean, news travels faster. Yeah. Uh, and it's e with social media, you know, no one gives a crap. They'll just put it out. Mainstream media, I think, yeah. is more controlled by the government. I think it would depend on how you brought it out. But I, I think you're right. I think they'd end up. They are trying to silence this whole thing. I think they they would put a stop to it if if one was shot. But 
Uh, and I agree with if you. Someone, I think, think they have shot them in the past. Yeah, I think I think there's been some shot, and they've and the government's come. If someone was to shoot one or, or, or just came across one accidentally, like hit one with a car, I mean, they just have to be, like you said, they need to be smart about it. You know, take some hair samples if you can get a blood sample and hide that because no, nah, take its once, head off once. Yeah, <laughs> take get what you can and hide it because body's going to get taken. No, I couldn't agree with you more. Well, Chris, I'll have to have you back on the show. Keep up the YouTube. Again, for people out there, go to Sooner Sasquatch on YouTube and subscribe. Uh, Chris puts a lot of time out there, and and I I do enjoy your videos very much. Uh, But I appreciate you coming on, Chris. No, uh, thank you for uh, letting me come on. Uh, I'm a big fan of the show and what you're doing. Keep doing it, man. You're, You're doing an awesome job. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. What are we at? Two hours? Almost two hours? I don't know where my clock's at. Uh, (laughs) Should I call it a night or should I wrap it up? Uh, I guess we'll keep going. I want to welcome uh, Duke and Woody to the show. Uh, Duke, thanks for coming on tonight. How are you tonight? I'm doing great, Wes. How's everything going over there? Doing well, doing well. Woody, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here tonight. Yes, man. Thanks again for having me. Uh, I'm enjoying to come to the show and say hi. Got the Renegades on tonight. <laughs> Merry Christmas, guys. Merry Christmas. You know, it's interesting. Uh, and the guys have a, a podcast, the Renegade Podcast. Check it out on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, everywhere else. And it's um, turning out to be just more or less the three of us sitting around talking about stuff we normally talk about. It's kind of fun. I get to break Duke's balls on politics every chance I get. And <laughs> I get to break Woody's balls on just about everything. So it's it's kind of a fun fun podcast so if you get a chance to check it out it's on itunes stitcher i'm sure you'll find it on other podcast players but it's called the renegade podcast look for the uh, cowboy you know it's interesting i was talking to a guy today uh, and i wanted to tell you guys both this it, and he used to be a former cia i don't know they call him agents anyway he used to work formally for the cia and we got to talking about uh the kandahar giant And for people who don't know anything about the Kandahar Giant, go look it up on YouTube. It's where these soldiers claim to have killed this giant in Afghanistan. Anyway, we were talking about that. We were talking about Bigfoot stuff, but somehow we got on this Kandahar Giant story. And what was interesting is he came back and he said, you know, Wes, that's not a BS story. And I said, what, what do you mean by that? And he said, you know, when I was in Afghanistan, uh, we, we used to see stuff like that. And I was asking him, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, we used to have to report it. We'd fly around in helicopters, and we'd see those things coming in and out of the caves. They'd be 15, 20 feet tall, and they'd run like cheetahs on the open plains, but they mainly lived up in the mountains. And he goes, if you ever notice in Afghanistan, no one, none of the public lives near those mountains. Uh, All of the villages and stuff are pretty far away from the mountains. And I thought it was interesting. He said he used to he used to put it in his report because any sort of anomaly uh, that they saw, they had to put it in the report. He said after a while, they just quit reporting it because no one up top seemed to care. Off topic from uh, Bigfoot, but I thought I would uh, run it past you guys. I thought it was interesting. You know what's bizarre about that is I have another friend that's in the military. They were over there in that field of operations in Afghanistan doing things from the air. And they said it was common knowledge amongst them that there was, I wish I could remember the name, because they actually told me the name of the little mountain range over there. But it's like common knowledge amongst the locals and the military that there's uh, there's giants over in those mountains. Nobody goes there. Yeah, I find that very interesting, too, Wes. Uh, yeah, I find it very interesting that I think a lot of people don't know about that as well. And something uh, coming from uh, the gentleman that you were talking about uh, uh, CIA, you said former CIA. Didn't it? Yeah, he's former CIA. Former CIA. So uh, you know that's a, that's a very valuable source, and that's kind of scary knowing that there's something out there that you know is a giant that can run like a cheetah. So that's, uh, that's well, if they're fifteen, twenty feet tall and they're running at the same pace we would run, that would make them running at the speed of a cheetah. Yeah, that's a little concerning for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't outrun one. Get no. your stinger missile. No, absolutely not. I can barely outrun my two-year-old, much less a, a cheetah. <laughs> so I'd be screwed. I'd be the first one gone. I'd be a goner. Yeah, it's interesting, too. I get re- weird reports 
uh, sometimes from people. I've mentioned it in past shows, but uh, it was two in Alaska that I can think of that these guys said they, they saw these giants up in the mountains. And it was two separate guys over about a year's time. And they both described almost like the Kandahar giant is really what they were describing. Uh, he said mm-hmm. it looked very human-like, but they were way up in the mountains. And these guys were terrified. Uh, both both guys, I think, gave up hunting. And it's just interesting. There's so many weird things out there. And, and you know, when you bring it to some of these people in the military and some of these former government workers, and they don't flinch and they don't laugh, it almost makes you wish you didn't bring it up to them. Uh, because you, it, I guess I'd feel better if they were like, oh, come on. Uh, but I, I really haven't gotten that from... You'd feel better if they said, oh, no, that's, that's all BS and none of this is true. Yeah, right? yeah. For for a guy to come out like that and say, oh, yeah, I know all about it. You're like, what? Wait a minute. That's not the answer I was looking for. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I get where you're going with that. And they get all that squinty-eyed look and then they offer up actually more information and you're like, uh... You're supposed to be debunking this, man. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was trying to say, too. You're supposed to be debunking this, man. Don't agree with me. On your, don't agree with me. Yeah, it just worries me when you hear stuff like that, you know, and some of the conspiracy corners, uh, the shows that you and I used to do, Duke, and, yep. you know, you just you hear that stuff, and you're just like, oh, my God, what is going on in this world? Uh, and I think there's a lot more, you know, just like Dogman, just like Sasquatch, just there's so many things out there that we just don't know enough about and, and the giant is definitely one of them and how some of this stuff potentially could be tied together too that's the even creepier part of it that's definitely the part that worries me i know i got a big show tonight and i appreciate you guys stopping by uh to say hi to the audience check them out the renegade podcast itunes and stitcher uh, i have to have you guys back for maybe a roundtable discussion or we'll do a little bigfoot uh talk on a sure. future show. I know it's actually going to have some of the listeners come on and do maybe an open mic. Uh, if you guys would be game for coming on and maybe having a listener on. and That'd do be, a, That would be fun. Yeah, I, I think it'd be a blast too. For anybody that hasn't heard the Renegade show yet, it's sort of an open topic thing. And try and, try and imagine if uh, Howard Stern met Coast to Coast AM in an alley and there was a beat down and only one of them walked out. And that's pretty, <laughs> much, that's pretty much the way the show goes. Uh, well put well put duke yeah it's 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 a lot of fun too i'm having a good time with it i think you two guys are too and like we've said before it moves real fast uh, there's going to be a lot of different topics and we're, we're having a good time with it and i hope you, you people too are enjoying it so uh, yeah check us out uh, available on itunes stitcher and merry, merry christmas to you guys happy holidays and Wes, thanks again for having me here thanks woody thanks duke thanks guys for being here Yep, joyous holiday to everybody and both you guys, brothers. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thanks for stopping by. Yeah, it's called The Renegade Podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. Uh, Look for the cowboy. I have a lot of fun with those guys. And when I have time, I jump on with them. And it does move fast. It it really is a lot of fun. Uh, Merry Christmas to you guys again. And thank you for coming on. Before I bring Ron Moorhead on, I want to replay this 911 call. And there's actually two phone calls. Uh, this gentleman made to 911. I'm going to go ahead and play the first one and then the second one, and then I'll bring Ron Moorhead on. But take a listen to this. 911, what are you reporting? Uh, I got a strange going on out here. Something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Damn it, I'm really confused. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence, and he was dead when she hit the ground. I didn't see any cars. All I saw was my dog coming over the fence. 911, what are you reporting? Uh, we got someone or something crawling around out here. Did you see what it was? Was it a person or an animal? or? I can't tell. All I know is that my central light came on, and I just happened to glimpse and see this thing running across the yard. A good-sized man or something that looks like a man. I don't know what it was, just that it ran across the yard. Okay. You've had problems in the neighborhood before? Yeah, my dog was killed here just recently. I don't know what it was. Whatever it is, it's running. I couldn't catch it if I was going to chase it. But whatever it was, it was standing up. I'm out here looking through the window now, and I don't see anything. I don't want to go outside. Jesus Christ, you better... Sure. See ya. Hello. Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine. I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. Okay, hang on. He's right... Is he in your yard, sir? 
there? Yeah, God, he's big. Okay, what's he doing in your yard? He's looking at me. Oh, and the guy is on foot. Just... I don't know what, it, it's, it's a big, real big person. That's all I can say. Okay, but it is a, it is a person. <laughs> yeah, I'd say it was a person, somebody really big. But he's all in black. He's... Is he a black male or a white male? Did you actually see whether, or was he just wearing black? He's all black and he's big. He is big. Well, I want to welcome uh, Ron to the show. Hey, Ron, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Wes. Thank you. And Merry Christmas to you. Happy holidays. It's good to hear from you. Right. That always goes well. Thank you. <laughs> Same to you. Yeah, and I know we'll be talking about the Lovelock Caves. Uh, before we get into that, I wanted to uh, discuss a 911 call uh, that I used to have in the – well, I still have it in the intro. Uh, and I know a lot of people always have questions about that. And uh, I know you and I have talked about it over the years, and the guy really didn't want – anything to do with the subject, but you actually had a chance to interview that gentleman. Uh, would you kind of start from the beginning and, and talk about what was going on around that property? What was your impression after talking to him and having his dog killed? And uh, yeah. if you would, just well, for the audience, because all they hear is a 911 call, you know? Uh huh. Well, I edited that. We got, I got, we got the, uh, Peter Byrne and I interviewed the man and uh, we got the, uh, the calls from the sheriff's department and uh, I edited it down so there was a lot of typing in between his his talking and, and the dispatchers talking and they were about two weeks apart uh, the two different calls the one call uh, the first one he made is when his dog got killed he don't know how that happened because he said he'd seen it fly over the fence um, uh, and it landed uh, we measured it 35 feet from the fence and what he said he heard was a big thump. And this was like 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning, something like that. He's working in his garage, and, and when this happened. Uh, anyway, um, uh, he was very compelling, very very uh, believable. And he was a Vietnam vet, and he was very sober. Uh, he had a hobby in his garage. And anyway, uh, we uh, I looked over to the other side of the fence looking to see if there's any horses or any sign of anything else and couldn't find anything. Uh, Peter uh, set up some uh, some cam a camera there to in case something else happened uh, after the second call because we didn't go there until after the second call. And that was, actually the second call is when his dog got killed. The first the first call. Uh, let's see. I better I should review my notes on this thing better. I guess. Yeah. No. But, no. I know the uh, the first call was his dog getting killed, and the second call is when he actually saw he it. Actually saw it. That's right. Yeah. Well, his dog was it was an older German Shepherd, a big dog, and uh, it was his favorite dog. Actually, he had two other smaller ones that used to always go out and yap and anything. But they came in and cowered, cowered down, and his German Shepherd went out, and that kind of puzzled him. Anyway, we tried to get the permission from him to dig the dog up. Uh, he wouldn't allow that, and uh, he just soon stay out of the picture. He he knows what he saw, and, and he knows he. <laughs> He knows he saw a Bigfoot, but he didn't want to say a Bigfoot on, on the, on the, this, to the dispatcher. They, they might have laughed him off and not sent anybody out. But uh, anyway, it was uh, very compelling, his, his uh, recount of that. Yeah, and it's hard to throw any dog, let alone German Shepherds. They tend to be pretty big dogs. And Oh, yeah. He but, said he heard a big thump, a big squeal, his dog, and a big thump like it got hit on the ground and thrown. And where it went over the fence, uh, he showed us a spot on the limb. It was like a, it was a tree close by, nine and a half feet up. Is where the dog comes sailing over. And so something with some strength had to do that. And I was thinking the only thing that could have possibly done that was, besides a, well, what he was claiming, was a, possibly a horse kicked it or something. So I was looking for those signs. There were even any horses in the area. It's on the, uh, actually on the Kitsap Peninsula, which is, I don't usually tell people that, but it doesn't really matter now. The guy doesn't live there any longer, I don't believe. And uh, so yeah. anyway, uh, that's kind of how it all went down. Yeah, I know it was here in Washington State. Did he ever describe to you what he saw? Because you can hear, really hear him uh, in, in the uh, recording. You know, he's like, Jesus Christ, get somebody out here. <laughs> and then he's saying, it's looking at me. Did he ever talk about what he saw? Oh, yeah, he told us what he saw. That's what he saw, uh, pretty much. Uh, that right there, he saw this thing looking at him. Standing, he had a car parked outside of his garage. He had these uh, these light sensors on the outside of his garage. And he had his garage doors closed, but he had the windows in his garage door. You know, like some of us do, let light in the daytime. 
and uh, this thing that triggered the sensor light at the at end of his car, which is right in front of his garage door. And uh, he looked out there and seen the thing looking at him, and uh, it really freaked him out. It was it was huge, and he didn't want to say seven foot something because <laughs> again it would have uh, maybe not allowed not uh, got the police out there or the sheriff's department out there when. They need to get out there right away. Oh, he also said a, a car went by and almost went into the ditch and uh, almost hit it when it ran away. It went across this old dirt road out there where he lived. Pretty wooded area. So we thought we I think we, we ran an ad in the paper to see if anybody would respond to it, if anybody see anything strange on that road, and uh, didn't get any replies to it. Yeah, did he was he able to get a look at the face or was it, it may, I realize it was dark it was early early in the morning when he saw it but did he describe the face or any details that stood out to you uh no I don't recall that now this has been oh, what 20 years ago <laughs> yeah that's I when I talked to him last so I have to really rake in the back of my head I got a good memory it's just not as long as it used to be <laughs> <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Did, did he end up? Did he have any more uh, encounters there that you know of, or was it just those two separate occasions? Not, not that we're aware of. No, and, and the first occasion he didn't know. He didn't see anything. It was the second occasion when he saw the Bigfoot out there, and uh, he he hadn't had any after that that we know of because we, I believe, we stayed in touch with him for a while. I actually tried to call him to get permission because I wanted to use the nine one one version on my CD. I never could. I never could find him. His phone number had been changed, and I guess he moved away. So I'm not sure he even hears, because a lot of people have plagiarized that and used it, and uh, I don't mind, because it's an interesting call. But it's just uh, something that I produced uh, from the uh, from the version the uh, Sheriff's Department gave me. Yeah, and it's, it's probably one of the scariest, most compelling uh, <laughs> yeah. phone calls ever, because you can almost hear it in the guy's voice. He knows he sees something. He knows it's not a man. But, it, you know, as a people listening, you can put yourself in his shoes. And you're not going to say it's Bigfoot. You're not going to say it's Sasquatch because right. you want someone to come out and help you. Uh, but when he says six foot nine and uh, the lady says, well, was it a man? And he's kind of paused for a second. He oh. says, well, I, you know. Black man. All in black. Yeah, all in <laughs> black. Uh, it reminds me of witnesses I talk to nowadays. Uh, uh-huh. But it's um, it's an inter- and I'm glad to have you on. If uh, but uh-huh. if people want to hear it, if you go to ronmorehead dot com, uh, you can get um, all of the audio CDs, some of the best stuff I've ever heard. I really enjoy it. So thank you, Ron, for for putting that out. You know, again, I've never heard the first nine one one call. I knew he had oh. he had even mentioned that to the uh, almost like the nine one one operator knew right ahead. She said you've had problems in the past and. Uh-huh. Uh, you know, but to hear that first call, uh, he sounded really confused. He sounded scared. He, it seemed like he didn't know what was going on in that first call when his dog was killed. He didn't. He didn't know. And, uh, yeah, it's it's on my second CD, the one I produced uh, that I narrate. It's about 40 minutes long altogether, but it has other sounds in it, too. And I, I put that, uh, not, it isn't part of our story, but it's part of something I thought was just really cool, <laughs> really com- compelling. So I stuck it in the second CD, uh, Bigfoot Sounds uh, Volume 2. And it'll, I, yeah, and, and again, if you go to ronmorehead.com, you can order all of that. I, I recommend, uh, Ron's always kind enough to let me use some of his sounds and some different narrations that I do. But um, I love it. I mean, I have both of them, and I highly recommend it to people. I really appreciate you talking about the, the, the 911 call. Because I know it, it fascinates people when they hear it. You know, it, it, it it's on YouTube, and it's you know I know it's out there everywhere. But it it's fascinating to listen to. I mean, it's it's one of those calls because you can hear such emotion in his voice. It almost makes you wonder. I know you can't answer this question, but it almost makes you wonder if the nine one one operator knew something was going on. Because she specifically yeah, I, asked him, you know, is yeah. I don't think she she didn't want to say it, and he didn't want to say it. But I think they may have been thinking the same thing um, that it was what it was. But you, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about their dogs over the years. So I've been doing this for what forty five years now, and uh, the interviews I've taken and listened to people. Uh, that's why I put that uh, YouTube video out there because we we love our dogs. I mean, I got two of them here. It's just. 
uh, you don't want to lose your dog, but sometimes they'll come back coward. Sometimes they won't come back at all because they want to protect their owner, you. And, and they'll go out chasing these things, and uh, these things don't like that because they, they expose them and they'll kill them. <laughs> or if they're a good dog, they'll come back when you call them. But why take that chance? And if you want to get closer to these things and want to have interaction, you don't take a dog because they're going to work, they're going to run one off or they're going to get killed trying. So that's my suggestion anyway. So anyway, I just don't suggest people taking dogs. Uh, I don't take dogs. We took one up to our Sierra camp one time. I wasn't there when I shouldn't say we because the other guys did when I wasn't going up. But um, they never did figure out how it got inside the shelter with them with the collar that it had on, but it did without tearing its ears off. It just uh, wouldn't stay outside, and it wouldn't go outside the rest of the time the guys were there. So that was the last time a dog went to our camp. And so it scares them. Something they can do, entangle them or something uh, that they can do what they want to with the dog. And some people go out and say, well, my dog's fine with them. Well, okay, then take your dog if, if, if it feels good to you and nothing's happening. But uh, Yeah, it's a risk. It's a risk, and why take it? Uh, unless you just want your dog with you to keep these things at bay, and that will happen. No, you're right. You're right about dogs. And if everyone out there, if they get a chance, go to uh, ronmoorhead.com and check out Bigfoot Sounds Volume 1 and Volume 2. I know Ron has his books on there, too, as well. And most of you have heard a lot of his sounds. I want to play a little clip from his Bigfoot Sounds. This always creeped me out. And I know most of these sounds were recorded in the early 70s, uh, but check this out. Oh. 
They sound like he talks to others and they talk to each other. Yeah. Oh, hold on, hold on. Hold on. That audio still creeps me out. Uh, <laughs> it's creepy, isn't it? I mean, you got to agree with me a little bit on that. That's creepy. Uh, but that was taken by Ron Moorhead and I believe the Johnson brothers uh, back in the early 70s up at a hunting camp. And I swear that never gets old. Uh, but that's not really why we're here tonight. If you want to hear more of that, go to ronmoorhead.com. You can order the Bigfoot Sounds CD 1 and 2. You can also check out the books he has up there. One of the things I wanted to talk about tonight uh, was the Lovelock Caves. And, you know, as you start researching and start really investigating the Sasquatch topic, the Lovelock Caves actually comes up in conversation. And Sarah Winnemucca, who was a Paiute princess, talked about their heritage around that area. And what she talked about was these large redheaded giants that would trap the Paiutes and eat them. Very cannibalistic. Uh, Sarah Winnemucca really had nothing good to say about them. Uh, she said that they would hunt them down. They would eat the the Paiutes. Uh, very vicious, uh, very cold-hearted, and just giants. Basically, she was dr- describing red-headed giants uh, in this cave, and they lived around this cave. And if you look at on YouTube, if you ever go and look up the, the Lovelock Cave, what's interesting about the cave is – it almost appears like there was a lake out there at one time. And I would imagine it would have been hard to ambush whoever was living in that cave because they'd see you coming for miles unless you came at night and you crossed over the lake. And that's exactly what Sarah describes. She describes this war that was going on with these giants. And the Paiutes had trapped all of these giants in this cave. They got tired of these giants terrorizing them. And so they trap them in this cave. They light a fire out kind of inside the cave, but just on the as a by the entrance, they light this huge fire, the huge thing. They they tell the giants to come out. Come out in the open, come out and fight. The giants refuse to come out, so they lit the fire. And I think a lot of the giants probably died from smoke inhalation. Uh, but as you read Sarah Winnemucca's account, and I highly recommend if you get a chance, check out Sarah Winnemucca. Go to Google, Google her. You can read some of her diary. Uh, but some of the giants did try to come out, and they were slaughtered the moment they came out of this cave. It's just fascinating to me to hear this. And it's not only the Paiutes that talk about it, but there's a lot of other tribes around this area that talk about these giants, these redheaded giants that were just menacing to the local Native Americans. And Ron, you went up to the Lovelock Caves, and I know you got a cool handprint uh, on the wall, almost like it looked like a giant had put its hand on the wall. Uh, at, you know, it looked like a fire, and someone had put its hand up on the wall. But what's your take on this whole Lovelock Cave situation? Well, they say they were redheaded giants, and. Uh course that's the Paiute legend and uh, again it was 1911 when the bad guana miners uh, discovered the artifacts that was in there of course all that artifacts is uh, not viewable now because the repatriate act uh, they've taken away and uh, however there have there were some pictures and BLM told me that they were just robust people and so did the uh, Winnemucca Museum but really they were Excuse me. They were they were big compared to humans, a lot larger. And of course, the Aztecs and the Mayans. What got me into it is I was in South America, you know, and and uh, seeing the uh, Incas, and uh, they said they warred with the Aztecs and and the uh, Mayans in the Central America. Then you got the Aztecs and Mayans say they were warred with giants in the north. That takes us into North America, where Lovelock Cave is. And uh, I'm thinking that maybe some of the some of the 
secret uh, were, that were there uh, weren't all in the cave, and they really didn't kill them all. Of course, the war lasted, they say, for three years, and they didn't find that many uh, remains left in the cave, as according to Sarah Winnemarca. So I'm wondering if some of them didn't get out and just been reclusive and carried on. Because you got the minaret skull uh, that was found by Dr. Denton in, in the minarets of Sierras, and then you've got the uh, uh, Martindale mummies, which were found in Yosemite uh, in um, 1898, I think it was. And anyway, those things are around. There's a history of giants in this in this North America, and it seems like it's being suppressed by by the powers to be. Uh, for one reason or another, you don't get to view them. It's interesting. I know the Comanches talked even about these redheaded giants, and most of the tribes down in the Southwest actually describe these redheaded giants. I know there was a miner, I think his name was John T. Reed. It was in 1886. He was mining the area, and he was pros- he's a, I think he was a mining engineer, but he was prospecting this area, and he was talking to the Paiutes, and they we're recounting the story of giants. And I think he's the one that originally found the cave or refound the cave. They told him exactly where it was at, exactly what happened and the, and the whole story. Uh, what was your take when you went there? What did, what did you learn from, from going there? And can you kind of describe the area for the audience who hasn't seen it or hasn't experienced? Uh, that yeah. Part? The level of cave itself, it looks like it's up in a mountain, but that, that mountain, a small mountain, uh, where the cave is, there's a trail going up there. We can park down below and walk up there. But the uh, it overlooks this big uh, well, the Humboldt Lake bed, which used to be a lake, uh, but it's dry now. And I understand there's other remains been found by the eight foot tall remains. But uh, it's a interesting area. It's just a dry lake bed now, but I guess it used to be filled with water. And some of the mummies they found uh, in, inside that cave years ago. Was actually wrapped in in uh, fishnet, which tells me that there were fish in that lake too, uh, which wouldn't seem so strange except that lake isn't doesn't look like it was very deep, uh, and that it's all level. But that could be because of the winds and the sand over all these years. Quite an interesting area. It's out in the middle of nowhere, and uh, you have to just follow the signs to get there. But as soon as you get close to it, you'll see the cave in the mountain, and uh, it's kind of interesting to go into. They built a little platform in there so you can walk around in there and look. Of course, we got out of the platform and, and really went around. But when we found that uh, inference of a hand, which I was mentioning earlier, strangely enough, I thought, well, that's interesting. I don't know if it's really a handprint or if it just looks like a handprint. But if it's a handprint, it's really a big handprint. I went back, uh, I think it was about three weeks later, and it was gone. Been washed off the rock or blasted off the rock somehow. But how do you do that in an archaeological site without... Uh, without a permit, unless you do it illegally or unless someone just tells you to that pays your wages. Uh, but uh, I guess the when M.K. Uh, Davis, who actually discovered the hand uh, originally with uh, Don Monroe, and they took me in there, <clears throat> they they put it up on their site, uh, and all, all the people could see it then. And I guess it was getting a lot of publicity, and uh, somebody just took it off, and it's gone. I went back there later to uh, get some samples for it. It was gone. I got a before and after picture and also a lot of other, other interesting pictures of when it was there. Yeah, that's, it's always, that seems real shady to me. That it whenever you find, <laughs> yeah. I mean, whenever you find something like that and you kind of put it on the net, then you go back and it's gone. Uh, uh-huh. It makes you wonder. And, it, and you know, if the, if the Paiute legend is true, uh, which I believe that it is, you would expect to find handprints like that up on the wall of, of people, cho- you know, whatever, whatever these things were, whether they were Nephilim or Sasquatch, and I can get your take on that in a moment. But you would expect as something's choking on, they probably died from smoke rather than fire. They probably inhaled all the smoke and died from it. But you would expect to see handprints on the wall. You know, that last moment of dying, you know, someone trying to get up and get out of there. It's a vicious story. It's a very violent story. But, you know, as I know in Sarah Winnemucca Hopkins, as she's talking about it, some did try to come out of that cave, and they, they killed them the moment they came out, and the rest right. of them stayed in that cave. So you can imagine the terror in that whole situation. And as I was reading about some of this back, I think it was 1911 after the Guana uh, miners 
started coming across all these artifacts. And it wasn't just one or two. They came across so many artifacts, uh, very cool artifacts. You can even see online of, of not fake ducks. What am I thinking of? Um, yeah, uh, read, remain out of reach. Yeah, you know, the, the duck, <coughs> ducks they would put out to decoys. have the other. Decoys. Yeah, yeah, decoys is what I'm, I don't know why I can't think of decoys, but uh, duck decoys and, and just all of this stuff. I think they even found a 15 inch pair of long sandals that had appeared that had appeared to have been worn and kind of worn out right. um, and they talked about some of the height of these mummies that were they were pulling out were eight to ten feet tall so they're true monsters true giants uh and it's just not the Paiutes. that's the other interesting part is if you talk to a lot of the natives in that area like the comanches and some of the other tribes they describe the same thing that was going on there I know a lot of people read the story about the Lovelock Caves and they immediately think, oh, Sasquatch, cannibalistic giant. But I'm, I am i don't know that they were Sasquatch. I mean, I could be wrong. What's your take? What do you think that they ran into? Do you think it was a Nephilim? Do you think it was just some weird group of people that were extremely tall and extremely big? Or do you think it was Sasquatch? What's, what's your take? Well, as we, as we know, the Nephilim were a, a hybrid and they were crossed between a celestial intervention into humanity which created a hybrid and giants, and uh, that's biblical, Genesis 6. So uh, the Nephilim were uh, cannibalistic. They were eating uh, people, and uh, that's why the flood came, was to save God's race of people, because Enoch, uh, who was Noah's great-great-grandfather, was uh, still had a pure line going, and so uh, Noah had a clean, he wasn't uh, infected by the genome. Uh, and that was all to stop the Savior from coming, if you want to get into the spiritual part of all this. That's, that was an Ephilim. Uh, what these things are, there's, there's also other giants. I don't think they're all the same genome, whatever they are. Uh, today, I don't think they're all the same genome. I think they could be totally different. Because anyone who denies a celestial intervention into this earth has got their head in the sand. It's just uh, obvious in a lot of places I've been to and seen and different things I've seen. That something beyond us, as far as intelligence, or as far as technology goes, uh, has been here, and what they've done uh, is beyond us too, beyond our technology, and especially in South America, where I've been a couple times. Anyway, uh, I think giants uh, could be. Uh, well, they say dilution is uh, the solution to di- <laughs> the solution to pollution is dilution. There's a good <laughs> so. If you uh, if you cross between the Native Americans and the and the uh, giants that were here, you'll still have uh, things that aren't 100 percent human, but they become more and more human as they as they inbreed, and that that means their uh, chromosome count would have to be pretty close to identical. But if the Nephilim, if they are part Nephilim, uh, they would have to have the same chromosome count as we do, I think. It's just they're not sapient like we are. We're made in God's image as sapient people, where the giants and the Bigfoots and all, they're not, they're sapient, but they're not made in God's image. There's a difference. Whose image are they made of is a good question I have, and that's that's uh, whatever the creator was, a celestial being of some type. I know in 1931, the, here's the part where I, I think they probably weren't Sasquatch. And this is not only mentioned here, but it was also mentioned in the late 1800s. Uh, by one of, uh, I think it was Sarah that was talking about it. But I know in 1931, there were, in the Nevada newspaper, they had reported that two miners had found two very large mummified skeletons just outside the cave. Actually, it would have been near where the lake would have been, uh, where they found these, they dug them up as they, as they were out mining. But the interesting part is the miners had turned them over to the museum at that time, and it was reported in the paper that they had been mummified the same way as the ancient Egyptians. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that tells me right there that it probably wasn't Sasquatch. I mean, I could be wrong, but these were somebody important. You know, and even like the traps that they do, uh, Sarah would talk about them digging large holes as traps. And the Native Americans, the Paiutes, would fall into the holes. And then the giants would come back, get them out and eat them, kill them and eat them. Uh, and and you just you don't hear stuff like that, I guess, with the Sasquatch record. But if you look up a lot of the Nephilim, old stories about the Nephilim, about them being man eaters, and I think even Sitaka means tall eater. They were hunters of men. 
They basically would eat the Paiutes every chance they got. They would go and kill them every chance they got. It's just a fascinating story. You know, finding the artifacts and the handprint you're talking about. When, when you saw that handprint, how would you say it was double the size of a normal man's hand? Or how big would at you? Least, at least. Yeah, at least. It was at least twice the size. Well, I sent you a picture. You can post that and people could see. Uh, what, however, I didn't show you the one with the knife, did I? There was a knife beside it, which was 12 inches long, which I would tell you how big the handprint was. If it's a handprint, i got to keep throwing that in there because um, there's a chance that's just an inference where you just would just infer that it's a, a handprint. And it's really not just some other way that got there, which I don't know how, but it got there some way. And it's the same, like I'm saying, the same goop that's on the ceilings where the fire caused uh, on that big boulder that's there, if it was there. The boulder's still there, but again, the handprint's gone. But Sikata, I've, I've got a different name for the Sikata, which means tule eaters. Uh, that's that's the, uh, what I've heard the Paiutes call them, was tule eaters. Yeah, oh. I've, I've gotten that one too. One one translates as tall eaters. It might have been the Comanches that maybe translated that, but... And then the Thule eaters, yeah, I saw that too as well. I mean, most people you can look at it and go, ah, oh, that's BS. But the more you kind of dig into the story, especially stuff that was actually written about it outside of what the Paiutes said, there was something in that cave. And I know you went back four times. Uh, what kept what kept you going back? And was there anything interesting that you found? Oh, I had more questions. I, I went into Winnemucca too, went to museum there, I went to Winnemucca. Lovelock Museum also, just trying to dig up information to see if they had any artifacts there that, that was related to this. and <laughs> They didn't. It's all gone. Uh, they had a lot of artifacts there from the Paiutes. So they freely show that. Anyway, it being an archaeological site, I just wonder how anybody uh, from the government, well, that's a stupid question before I even ask it. <laughs> they can do anything they want to do. Yeah. But for them, for Sarah Winnemucca to say there were so many of them, and the war went on for three years, and there were so many thousands of them, well, yet there's only 46 or 45 remains found in the cave. I mean, some of them didn't get burned up. And, uh, of course, they say some of them got shot on them trying to come out, and I'm sure that happened, but that's a lot of people for one cave. <laughs> so they were strung out all over, and it wasn't just the Paiutes in that area. It was the Paiutes from all over in the Utah and Arizona. They all gathered together to uh, try to stop these things. It's the story the way the story went. So I, I have no doubts that some of them are just got away, and that may be what we're dealing with 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 some of these Bigfoots that uh, they're aggressive. But again, there's different kinds of Bigfoots out there. I want to keep stressing. I really believe that wholeheartedly. Now I want to get into this. Uh, just different genomes and for different purposes. Uh, some of them, like, a lot of people claim they're their friends and. They're trying to help us. And actually, the ones we ran into in the Sierras when we were recording these vocalizations were seemingly friendly. Now, were they just trying to trick us into trusting them so they could do something sinister? I don't know. But it seemed like we were interacting with them on a more and more friendly basis when we started getting their vocalizations. And um, what their intentions were, we don't know. My last encounter, a true encounter, was in 2011 when I was up there. And I write about that in my, my book. But it was uh, quite uh, eye-opening <laughs> for me. I was by myself, and that's a little bit spooky, because uh, we still don't know what we're dealing with. You don't know if they're good or bad. We hope they're good, but I know some of them have got bad history. You know, they, they throw rocks at people. They, some people just turn up missing. and So I, I don't know. You know, we're all trying to explore and research this thing, and, uh, I, my new book and my new PowerPoint program is uh, getting into a lot of these different theories and where I'm turning to as far as my hypothesis goes. You wrote about that encounter. Was that in Voices in the Wilderness? Yeah. Yeah. That was my 2013 uh, uh, reprint. Yeah. Well, I know we're talking about the Lovelock Caves, but I know the audience is probably going to be wondering now. Uh, most people know about all the Sierra sounds that you collected and and the experiences you had up in there. But do you mind telling the audience about the one in 2011? You were by yourself? I was, and that's not supposed to happen, but uh, Scott Nelson, the cryptolinguist that uh, has uh, transcribed uh, sounds in our recordings and claims that there's, uh, <coughs> excuse me, language by the human definition of language, which, by the way, let me say this real quick. Definition of language by the human definition <laughs> is... Of what they call a morphine stream, a stream of words that make up a, 
a sentence. And it's not a yeller screen. That's not what he analyzes. He analyzes what they call morphine streams. And we have that on our recordings where there's actually conversation going on in the morphine streams. So he went up there, he and I, uh, three times in the summer. And we stayed about a week at a time. And I came back out, showered, resupplied, and walked back. And we walked. We was in really good shape by the time the third trip came on. Yeah, I bet. And, uh, so uh, he went back to his teaching job in, uh, in uh, Missouri. And I wanted to go up there again just to see because nothing happened. He was trying to get some more cooperative uh, sounds recorded, but we couldn't capture anything. Of course, he had his tape recorder going 24-7, and somehow that makes a difference with these things, I guess, nowadays. So I had a guy lined up to go with me who was one of the originals, and uh, he backed out the last minute. So I, uh, I went up by myself. Thinking, well, I got to find out if they're around or not because it may be that because Scott was up there with recorders, the reason they didn't interact, reason they didn't do anything, and I know if they remember who I am and know who I am, they'll probably make something happen. Well, I went up there by myself. The, the little shelter we had was not doing so well, so I set up this little tent that we keep up there, kept up there, and uh, the mosquitoes were so bad that afternoon, just really irritating me so I got inside the tent zipped it up and started reading a book and right outside while it was still light this big pop went off I, I related in my book as a tree knock but it was so loud uh, it was like a gunshot going off and I I have to recount that and think maybe was it a tree knock or just what was it anyway I didn't jump out because that's what they want they want to see what you're going to do when that stuff happens but I waited about 15 minutes I stepped out of the tent and started waving the towel on my face to keep the mosquitoes off and started yelling at them, talking to them and asking them to come out and let me see who they were, let me know more about them so I can help and do something. And nothing, nothing at all. So I went back in the tent and I started getting dark. And then I read the book for a while and got my tape recorder ready just in case something happens. Checked it all out, put the brand new lithium batteries in it and everything's working fine. 10 o'clock that night, I heard this chatter, which is a Bigfoot chatter, and I recognized it immediately. And immediately after the chatter, uh, which was probably 7,500 feet away, uh, bam, this little pop goes on on one of these old barrels we had outside we took and used to put, used to put trash in now. And I hear this thing walk around out there, a bipedal walk. And uh, that'll, that'll jar you a little bit. Anyway, it takes the slack right out of you. And I'm sitting there at attention. I said, I told you earlier not to come back at night and scare me. <laughs> of course, I'm supposed to be the fearless one, you know. But uh, you can't help it a little bit when you really don't have a, a weapon or anything. Of course, I'm not sure a weapon would stop these things if you ever was to get a shot at one. But I didn't have uh, anything but I think it was a 22 with bird shot in it to scare the bear away in case they wanted the food, my food that I took up there. The thing was walking around out there, and I was talking to it then because I knew it was out there. And I think, in retrospect, it was looking for food that I did not leave out. All of a sudden, it walked up to my I hear it standing right there beside my tent, and uh, and I was just paralyzed. I couldn't get my tape recorder to work. Uh, nothing was working. I tape by the way, next morning, I found the batteries were dead, and that's something else happens around these things. They drain your batteries, and. Also, I think there's something going on with energy in these things. And uh, that pop that I heard, <laughs> it may not have been a tree knock at all. It might have been something to do with trees, though. But if these things are interdimensional, like I believe some of them to be, and maybe the ones I'm dealing with up there are too, it's their energy changing from one dimension to another. It requires energy. And that's that's kind of out there. It's just a theory. and. I don't want anybody to throw me in the ditch because of this, but it's it's something that I've heard many, many reports about. I've actually got a very credible, I thought credible, witness that said they saw this happen. They saw a cloak and go into a tree, and and they've also witnesses say they've come out that way. And I hear report after report saying they saw them up in trees, which isn't unusual. But is there something going on with trees and these things? And I know for pretty sure I know that, that they actually single each other th with tree knocks. But this sound I heard right outside my tent that night in 2011, or that afternoon, I should say, 
uh, was more than just a tree knock. It was loud. And uh, it had to be one tree hitting against another one or something like that, if, it was, if that was even possible. But I'm wondering uh, if it wasn't some kind of an energy uh, effect, which is uh, another theory altogether. But uh, I, I do think that, uh, that to have an attribute uh, that allows them to transfer out of our, our light perception our light perception is a frequency, and that frequency, once it's raised to a certain um, elevation, will will change, and we won't see it. It just leaves our perception. So if they have that ability to go from three dimension into another dimension, uh, we just wouldn't see them. They're still around, but you just don't see them. It's just their energy. They, they're able to change their energy, which we all are made of energy, as, as you probably know, at the most minute uh, element in our body we're we're energy uh, that energy uh, never 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 dies and that's what religions calls you go to heaven because when your body dies that energy leaves you go to another you go to heaven whatever that is uh, quantum physics says uh, you change dimensions because your energy cannot according to Stephen Hawkins it, it cannot die so it doesn't get wrapped up in a black hole either it gets spit out so uh that may be what dark matter is in the universe. I'm just guessing at all this stuff. It's kind of fun to guess, though, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is. <laughs> it is. But anyway, I, I think uh, these things may have some of these abilities that we just don't understand. I, I don't really believe there anything. There is like a paranormal attribute. It's just things we don't understand, which makes it seem paranormal to us, but it's just normal to them. And I think we'll, we'll understand it. We will. It's just a matter of us progressing a little further. So there's another thought about these things, too. Could they just be as something that's evolved more than we have and able to do the things that we should be able to do if we can change our vibrational frequency to, a, to another degree and get it on up? Because, you know, even sound, when you raise it to high enough, it changes into light. And uh, you get all these weird things when you get into quantum physics. It's hard to wrap your head around because... All we can seem to believe in is our three-dimensional world that we see, feel, and touch with our eyes. And, and it's just, um, there's more going on. That's all I'm saying, Wes. There's a lot more going on than what we can see. And I'm trying to get people to follow that with me, but it's hard to explain quantum physics to some people. It just, it's just, uh, but it's there. It's part of our everyday life. It's just you don't see it. There's several dimensions exist, and... Uh, I believe that uh, aliens probably are able to use those dimensions, and that's how they do what they do. That's how they move so fast. These things move fast. The one I saw the night of 74 uh, was going so fast, it was just uh, ridiculous. And uh, anyway, I don't know how they do what they do, but I'm guessing at all this, so. I hear you, and I, I, you know, you, I've, I think you know I've always respected your opinion and I know, you know, a couple of years ago, I thought I had everything figured out and, uh, you know, I had it all figured out and I, I could tell you exactly what they were, you know. And as you get into this, you realize the more you get into this and the more you're willing to listen to people and what they say they've seen and what they say they've experienced, you start finding out really quick that you really have nothing figured out. Oh. I know your book's coming out, The Quantum Bigfoot, sometime next year, and I, I can't wait to... uh read it because you know Ron I get these really strange odd reports and I used to brush them off because you know a lot of times they would come from I don't want to name any names but they would come from different researchers in the community or people that called them researchers and it was like they would try and cram it down your throat because they have it figured out and that's the I think the biggest turnoff on some of that and the one thing I've always respected about you is uh, you're willing to kind of look at everything and acknowledge hey these, these are just my theories i you know i could be wrong at the end of the day and you know some of these odd reports you get from people i've noticed with what either you call it paranormal or you call it science whatever you want to call it the really odd strange reports to me sound more demonic that might be more of my religious background my perspective on it you know automatically label it as as demonic but the interesting part about it is you don't really get those types of reports from like hunters or hikers. I haven't gotten too many of those really strange off the wall 
where I, I'm left scratching my head about what they saw. A lot of times with the, the strange paranormal type reports, you get it from people who have them around their property or who are feeding with them or who are oh. gifting with them. And that's what makes me nervous because now you're kind of in bed with them. There's some sort of interaction going on. And those are the people that are seeing some of this strange stuff going on. And I've had a couple of witnesses here recently that had stuff going on around, around their property. Two brothers, you know, you and I talked about it, the two brothers that um, they were going to shoot them. They were going to start blasting these things because they would not stop terrorizing these guys. And then all this weird stuff started happening. And there's way too more to the story than I've ever said on the air. But there was so much weird stuff going on around this property. Uh, you know the story. Or everyone knows the story through open mic. I'm not going to go through it again. But it stopped. And and when I talked to them, I could tell there was a difference from the first time I spoke with them and this time. I mean, night and day. These guys were night and day. They went from high stress, not sleeping, uh, rattling off, you know, this is going on, this is going on, we're going to shoot them, we're going to shoot, you know, to now they're completely relaxed. And so it's like, I don't have an answer for that. I, I mean, I can't really explain. But didn't you, Wes, uh, didn't you and I talk in between these uh, two, them being relaxed and them not being relaxed? Oh, yeah. No, you and I have talked about it several times. Well, what I mentioned, and I don't know if they, they thought about it or if you mentioned it to them, but if you know who you are as a human being on this face of this earth made in the image of God, and I don't, I'm not a religious person, but I keep sounding like I am, but a spiritual person. And if you know the authority you've been given on this earth, you can feel very comfortable around these things. And you can, you can demand that they leave you alone, and they will, because they have to. And uh, that may be what happened to these guys. Maybe they found out who they were as a human being. Uh, I'm just guessing at that again, too. <laughs> well, no, but that it's... will give you a certain amount of... Uh, relaxation and it's just like when I knew one was outside in the daylight I went out there and uh, you know whatever it was was huge I'm sure uh, because they're big and yet I'm up there without a gun I'm not even thinking about a gun I'm not thinking I'm going to shoot one because it's not going to happen uh, but I also know that my authority is who I am and, and I know that they even though they're bigger stronger faster everything they don't have what I have that makes me a freer person around them. Well, and you know, some people might roll their eyes about what you just said, but I'll tell you about an encounter I've never said on the air uh, with the guy I spoke with. Uh, he was pretty high up. I want to say he was Mormon. He might have been Catholic. He was pretty high up in the church, and that's why he didn't want to come on the air. I guess he's well known in one of the religions. Uh, but he was telling me about an encounter that he had where these things were surrounding him. He was actually hiking, and these things were surrounding him. And he had no clue what it was. And he just described them as uh, apes surrounding him. Uh, he said they would run from the, you know, run in the bush and kind of stop. They were basically walking him out, but they would kept surrounding him. They'd move from all around this guy as he's trying to get out, walking down this trail. And he said the odd part is he stopped and sat down and started praying because he didn't know what else to do. And he was asking God to, you know, please just have these things. I just want to live. And, you know, the guy's in tears. I think he's in his 60s. He's in tears as he's on the phone with me as he's talking about this. But he said he was praying and just saying, please get me out of here. Like, I don't I don't know what, what's going on here. Uh, he told me, he goes, I didn't think there were bears, and I didn't think there were people. He goes, I don't know what it was. It reminded me of apes. The interesting part is they left him alone after that. Uh -huh. He said they left the area. And he got up and ran the rest of the way out of there. But is that coincidence? I mean, do you, do you hear a story like that? You, you know, and this guy's describing him from head to toe. And you can tell he's not really done any Bigfoot research because he didn't, couldn't really just, he could describe what he saw, but he was describing them. He goes, I thought just a bunch of apes got loose out of the zoo. But he goes, there was something different about these things. They looked human, but they looked like apes. He goes, I don't know if that makes any sense or not. But and he goes, they were huge. They were about eight feet tall. They were huge. It was just fascinating to talk with him because, you know, because of his religious beliefs, he sits down, and starts praying. I think even an atheist at that point might get down and on one, on their <laughs> knees and start praying, you know, yeah. in a situation like that. But it was interesting that they left him alone after that. I don't know if that's just a weird coincidence. 
that they just got bored with him or if there's something to that. That story was way before the brothers told me about oh. what happened out there. With the subject, the, uh, you know, that's why I think there's so much infighting with the Bigfoot community is everyone's got it figured out. But the truly intelligent people realize really quick, no one has anything figured out. There's too many weird things that go on. That's what's taken me so long to finish this quantum Bigfoot because I'm learning something every day. Uh, and, and it's just, it goes on and on. I can't stop. It just, of course, Al Berry taught me this years ago. He says, you just got to say it's good enough and let it go. But I can't say it's good enough yet because I keep learning more and more. Uh, uh, the light frequency perception that we have and uh, how nothing's really real. We, we live in a... And like you say, a lot of people are going to roll their eyes at stuff I say, but you know what? I don't care, Wes, anymore. Uh, it is what it is, whatever it is. I'm open-minded, and I, I try to impress upon researchers to be open-minded. And when you have just uh, the uh, thought of classical science, which stays within a certain parameter, you know, of, their, of what they have to do uh, when there's uh, so much information and how you repeat experiments and and if you just go by that, which that's the way a lot of researchers do, and I respect that. But when you get to where that doesn't answer your questions, you've got to reach somewhere else. And you still want to stay with something solid, so you get into what I've done, is got into quantum physics. And I encourage anybody, if, they, if they're not understanding what I'm saying when I say perception and light frequency, things like that, just read what Einstein, what uh, Nikola Tesla wrote about, what they say. And really, there's no difference in spirituality and quantum physics, in my opinion. They seem to think the same way back 100 years ago. But classical science nowadays uh, stays within its box, and they don't reach out of it. If they can't have the evidence, if they can't support it by this, 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 and this, all in three-dimensional world, then they're not going to accept it. But there's more going on than our three dimensions, and that's, that's what I'm saying. And if you believe in, in a hereafter or other dimensions, if you want to go that way, then I really highly recommend looking into physics, quantum physics. Uh, and that will also turn you on to how I feel about who we are as humans, because you put that with, with scriptural texts, uh, you, you really got, we're really something special. <laughs> and I think if you believe that and know it, uh, these things, you know, years ago uh, in the 70s when Lewis Johnson, who wanted to be at that camp. He's one of the original brothers at our camp. He was he wanted to be there for hunting. He didn't want these things messing with us anymore. And one time he just said, I wish you'd just shut up and go away because they were chattering out. And you know, immediately they stopped and they didn't mess with us again that whole weekend. And uh, That's interesting. Uh, yeah, and it just, in uh, fact, that's on my first volume CD that Al Berry uh, uh, narrates, and, or Jonathan Frakes' Star Trek narrates, but I produced it. And, you know, it has that effect. And it is interesting that you bring that up because I've heard other people, and I tell them this, and uh, it kind of takes the fear factor a little bit down a notch and uh, helps you. Yeah, no, I think we're something special on this planet, too. And I think that a Sasquatch is something special. You know, it's and it's interesting, too. It's important to keep an open mind because if you look up the giants, it's like the, the whole subject of Bigfoot. I've told people in the past that, you know, balk at it. Take six months, look into it, and if you still think it's a bunch of mumbo-jumbo, I'll, I'll accept that. And I haven't had one person come back and do that. And it's the same thing with the giants and the Lovelock Caves. Uh, people will balk at the idea of giants. Well, take, take some time, go look up the Lovelock Caves. It is fascinating. Uh, there's tribes all around that area talking about these red-headed tall giants that would kill men. And you go and you start looking at some of the newspapers. At, during that time, and I'm talking within 50 years from the late 1800s up, you'll see where they, oh, we discovered these huge giant skulls, and they'll describe them and talk about how big they are, and even some of the old timers have seen them. Remember them being in the museum at one time, and now they're gone. And there's pictures of all the artifacts, and th those are gone. But you can see pictures of the artifacts they pulled out of that place. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but it's all gone. <laughs> Everything in this world, there's a lot more going on in this world, whether that was a Nephilim, Sasquatch, or some weird tribe of people, which I, I have a hard time buying into, just because of the size of these things and the way the Pites describe them. There's way more going on in this world than most of us realize. And going back to quantum physics, you're right. That is a fascinating topic. 
take time to go study quantum physics. I mean, that what you learn about the sound and different frequencies and uh, how everything on the planet or in our world has a certain frequency, vibrates at a certain frequency. Even a blade of grass vibrates at a certain frequency. And if it was outside of that frequency, you'd never see it. Uh, but because it's within a certain frequency, we can actually see, touch, smell, and interact with the reality around us. But just a, a small dial of the frequency, and a lot of the stuff you would never see, you would never experience. It would, just wouldn't be there. Well said. Well said. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a lot of history of giants on this uh, North America. Uh, Jim Vieira, who I spoke with years ago in Georgia, has such a portfolio on giants. The newspaper clippings you were mentioning a minute ago from the 1800s uh, all the way into the early 1900s. Uh, giant remains are being found all over the United States, but they just go away. Uh, he claims the Smithsonian has them. A lot of people are claiming that now. That they're just locked up because the government doesn't want those that type of same reason they, they suppress uh, UFO information, uh, UFO and uh, aliens, all that are commonplace in South America and, and in Central America. You go into Mexico and they don't they don't suppress it down there. They they see it all the time. I was taken to a place in, in Peru um, by a by the, the police there the chief of police with an armed escort to this big burial ground he took us up on this old decrepitated uh, oh, try, <laughs> whatever it was and he looked over uh, over this graveyard where there's a group of trees most of it was desert but there's a little group of trees way over there and he said where those trees are used to be a lake said, oh yeah I wonder what happened to him. he said well as soon as the UFO left it, it dried up and they all seen a UFO there I mean no big deal <laughs> but that's just one story, but this is the chief of police and a very credible. He just took it like commonplace. He didn't think anything of it. You're right. I mean, and it's almost with all of this stuff, uh, it's amazing how much is covered up. And I think if you don't think it's not being covered up, you're being a little foolish yeah. uh, because there is so much evidence of not only giants, there's evidence of aliens. I mean, I hate to sound like a crazy conspiracy guy, but just take a little time and, and for the audience, just take some time and, and look into some of this stuff. Do you think, and I know you're more spiritual than you are religious and I like that about you. Uh, <laughs> but do you think, cause there is a difference, you know, it's yes, sometimes like religious people. I, I have a hard time with sometimes, but anyway, uh, the point I'm trying to make is, do you think there's an aspect to Sasquatch that could possibly be demonic in some of this paranormal stuff you hear or, and, and here's where I'm going with it, Ron. Let me clarify what I just asked you. When people talk about the alien abductions, and I would love to do a show about alien abductions and actually have witnesses on that have experienced it. But when you listen to what they talk about, they talk about mind speak and a lot of the same propaganda that they claim they get from the aliens. Some of these people who are into Sasquatch, it's like the same speech they're getting from on the alien side, it's the same type of propaganda about saving the earth and avoiding war and how we're destroying each other. I mean, it's, mm. and, and I think it's more of a trickster on their end, give spilling that propaganda. But the strange part about it is it's the same story. And a lot of the same things that go on in alien encounters and in demonic encounters, and even sometimes with Sasquatch encounters. And I hate to say that, but it's all. It seems like to me the same thing is going on there. People are experiencing the same type of phenomenon, uh, just on different levels. Do you think there's any portion of it that could be demonic? Yes, I do. Some of it can, and some of it doesn't have to be. Like I mentioned earlier, I believe they have different genomes. They're from the different creations. Uh, there's good ones and there's bad ones. And uh, you've got the reptilians. You've got the wolf man, or whatever they call it. I've never, I've never gotten into those things, but I hear reports of them quite often. Uh, but they're also out of our perception, at least most of us. You've got the uh, Skinwalker Ranch, which I'm sure most of your listeners have probably read. If they haven't, they probably should. Uh, but it's interesting. It's interesting to read. Whether it's true or not, I don't know. I've been over it. I've never been in it, but I flew over it in my plane one time. And uh, it's just, uh, there's a lot going on. And yes, I do think some of them can be bad. And uh, some of them have bad intentions, and some of them have good intentions. They can be from a different lineage. 
uh, and I have a theory about that, which I think holds water, and it uh, goes all the way back to to the creation of sapient man. And uh, they can be good ones out there. And as we know, most of us know, anyway, the atmosphere was much different prior to the Great Deluge, the Great Flood, where the continents actually split. And that's been a long, long time ago. But that's how the uh, information was transferred, because it used to be just one continent. And you find the same elongation of the skulls in this uh, in this area here of uh, South America as you do in Egypt. And the same things going on, the same technology was used. Anyway, I forgot where I lost my train of thought there for a second. <laughs> no, I hear you. I, I, I get what you're going with it. It's, uh, it. Some of them definitely can be demonic. Some of them definitely can be. It seems like there is bad intentions on some. and Yeah, and for a certain outcome at the end. And I, I do think there will be an end. I think we should prepare for it. I'm not a doomsdayer, but I, I am prepared. But the best way you prepare is, again, go who you are as a human being and believe, just believe in that one energy that exists in all of us. And that, I'll call that energy God for better of another word. But uh, we are all one at the minute level. Everything is only perceivable because of, of the light dimension, the, the light frequency that we live in. So I'm kind of rattling. No, you're should, not rattling at all. I, should have had a better breakfast, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not rattling at all. It's it's interesting. The whole thing is fascinating. And, you know, like with these giants, going back to the Lovelock Caves, they're not too far off from even some historical accounts of, I'm talking way before our time, uh, historical accounts about redheaded giants. And I just wish people would take more time to look into some of this stuff. You know, like, um, and I won't go into it right now, but, Finding like Nimrod's tomb, I know we're way off topic right now, but uh, that's fascinating. Have you looked into that, Ron? Did you ever look into Nimrod's tomb being found? <clears throat> Not his tomb. I, I looked into Nimrod. You know, he was a descendant of Cain, actually through the lineage of uh, probably Ham's wife, who was in the flood. And Ham was one of Noah's sons, and uh, <clears throat> Nimrod was uh, one of the descendants out of that, that tribe of warring people and bad people. He was also responsible for. Uh, for the Tower of Babel, trying to build the Tower of Babel, which I guess you've heard of, you know, in Babylon. And uh, basically, at that time, men knew what their power of their words could be, and they were going to build a, t- uh, a temple that would go up into heaven. <laughs> I don't know if you remember that story or not. But, no, I do. Yeah, no, they they uh, actually did. They, they, they was going to, that was going to happen, and that's when the angels of God or whoever uh, said, we got to, disrupt their, their language so they can't talk to you. Because that combined energy, they can make that happen. And that's something we don't even get today, how we can combine our energy and make things happen. And if you get strong enough, you can do it on your own like Jesus did. You know? <coughs> Excuse me, he did those things on his own. He said we could do anything he's doing. Well, none of us are walking on water. Why not? We have not evolved enough into what we're supposed to be yet, Wes. And I think we need to get on that track. Maybe, just maybe, uh, Bigfoot has evolved further, some of them. And maybe they're from that same lineage that came through. Because a lot of them uh, seem to be remnants of, of that lineage that are here on Earth. Or that were here on Earth after the flood, even. That would have came through the lineage of, uh, like I say, in, 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 into the Noah's boat, basically. And they would not be the Nephilim. They would be 100% human beings, but they would be... Uh, they would be different because they were they were marked with something, and I know Cain himself was marked, but that doesn't mean his his DNA was marked for all his descendants. Because, as, as some of you know, the, the story of Lamech, who was his descendant, his, his great great grandson, who was blind, but he's also known as a hunter, a very good hunter, even being blind. But that his son, Tybal Cain, who would tell him where the prey was, and he would shoot the prey. Well, he did that one day. Uh, Tybal Cain thought he recognized an animal, and Lamech shot him. And it was Cain. He shot his own his, his own uh, heir, his own great-grandfather. And that means 70 times 7 uh, of the curses came on to Lamech's lineage, which brings it into a whole lot of people then. You got the uh, Mark, Michelangelo's painting. If you look at the bottom of it, there's a cave there. And that cave has two Edomites in it, and those Edomites were hairy, and that cave depicts hell. And they are supposedly uh, descendants from Esau, which uh, 
I got so many stories. <laughs> it's fun. No, it but, is. It is. Uh, I'll have to all say. All that stuff can get through, and, and it's such a diluted uh, crossbreeding and inbreeding and all that stuff went on, and who knows who's who. I know if you got six fingers and red hair, you better watch out and if you're eight foot tall. <laughs> yeah. No, it's interesting. I'll have to send you the Nimrod. But no, i got to look at Nimrod's uh, tomb. What did you – I have not read on that. Yeah, it was a month before we went into Iraq. They actually found his tomb, and they had dug it up. It's where the Euphrates used to be. I guess they had diverted the waters of the Euphrates and, and buried him under it and then reverted the waters back, which isn't too far off because there's other, other famous – tyrants in the past that they've done genghis kong they supposedly did that with his body uh but they had found it archaeologists had found nimrod's tomb and they call him uh nimrod or uh, what was it gigglemish or um gilgamesh yeah, yeah gilgamesh anyway but it's nimrod it's the same guy and they had found his tomb and they had dug up his body and the and the uh archaeologists that actually found it said she couldn't believe how well preserved his body was uh, almost like he was buried yesterday, uh, and he had been mummified just like the Egyptians did. But she was shocked how preserved his body was. Well, a month, thirty days later, we were in Iraq. Around that archaeology site, that archaeological site, they actually have a one of the biggest military bases, and it's still there. It's a U.S. military base. And going back to Nimrod's tomb, I don't think, or going back to the Tower of Babel, I don't think they were just building a tall building to get to heaven. I think it was some sort of stargate that they were doing something like what CERN is trying to do. Um, I had noted, I had read something online the other day that CERN had actually uh, not only discovered the God particle a couple of years back, but they also found the keys to get in and out of different dimensions or they through this particle accelerator accelerator. Uh, they had found a way to open dimension. I almost kind of think that's what Nimrod was trying to do, uh, mm. but it's, it's fascinating. You know, our history is so much more than what you read in the history books. And I, and I wish people would understand that because the real true history of us uh, isn't what you read in the history book. Just like the Paiute Indians talking about these redheaded, cannibalistic, 8 to 10 feet tall giants that they warred with all the time. The strange part is what the Paiutes talk about. You can go read ancient Sumerian texts that almost describe the exact same thing the Paiutes are talking about. Um, and so it's just fascinating. The whole thing's fascinating. I'm, I'm glad that I had a chance to uh, have you on to talk about the Lovelock Caves because that whole story fascinates me. And I know for the longest time, uh, a lot of Bigfoot researchers I talked to said, oh, yeah, that was Sasquatch in there. But the more you read about it, the more I, I don't think that it, it was. I mean, I could be wrong, but the, the more little details pop up and you're like, well, I don't, they sound more like people than they do real animal like. Well, the problem is, what is a Sasquatch? What is a Bigfoot? You know, everybody puts, puts them into one category or another, and I don't think that's the correct thing to do. I think there's different things out there, different types of these beings from different genomes. And uh, whether it was a Sasquatch or whether it was a Nephilim or whatever it was, I know the Bible says, if you want to get into the Red Letter Edition, it says, as it was in the days of Noah, so should also be in the second coming. Well, Trust me, there's giants here now, and there were giants here then. <laughs> so there's something going on that it's, it's like it was in the days of Noah, before, prior to the flood. And something else is going to happen. Giants are here now, and what, what their intentions are, and why they're staying so elusive and so hidden, and how they do what they do, is yet to be known. Yeah, it's terrifying. The whole subject is, uh, it, it, to me, it's terrifying. You know, And I've told, talked to witnesses that, uh, describe seeing giants. There's two of them in Alaska that talk about seeing, it was two hunters, two separate hunters that were way up in the mountains and describe seeing these giant beings. And they describe them more manlike uh, than mm-hmm. anything else. But, you know, even today, I mean, the, the Kandahar giant that the special ops supposedly killed yeah. uh, in there. I mean, there's little That's details. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's little details in that story to where I don't know that you could make up portions of that story. I guess you could, but there's little details. Like, you'd really have to know a lot about the Nephilim. And that's and the interesting part is that Kandahar giant, they described it as having red hair. And six six digits. Yeah, six, yeah. six fingers. And the other part is it ate the uh, – it killed and ate the, the first special forces that came in and ate them. 
And so you hear a story like that, and then you read what Sarah wrote, Winnemucca Hopkins, what she wrote. It's not far off from what the guys in Afghanistan were talking about. It sounds right. like it sounds like the exact same thing. <laughs> Could be. That's a big person. Uh, was it 18, 15, 18 feet tall? The one in Afghanistan. Yeah, it was a lot bigger. I want to say it was uh, fifteen feet. Is what the uh, Afghan or what the uh, special forces, the two that came forward, talked about. Uh-huh. Uh, but you're right; it had six digits. And well, I, I got a. Now we didn't have any six digit toes on any of the feet that we had up there at our camp in Sierra Camp. But the largest print we had, which I didn't talk about for a long, long time, was twenty five and a half inches, and it was thirteen feet between the between the feet prints. Wow. And, uh, you know, if you do the math on that, uh, that's tall, and it wasn't running. We, we found four different prints that went across this big area, and uh, just tromp, tromp, tromp. And it's the same configuration as the smaller ones we camp, we had around our camp, which is 18 to 22 inches. So one of them was nine inches, a small one. But uh, there's something big going on, and how do they stay so concealed? You know, that thing had to be at least 12 foot tall, and maybe much bigger. Yeah, I would uh, almost say bigger with a print like that. But that's a little bit uh, concerning, you know, what, what's going on. No, it is concerning. And, you know, I've talked to other researchers that won't come forward. I've, I've talked to like three of them now that have had found prints like that. And the reason mm-hmm. why they didn't want to come forward is they said, well, no one's going to, this is too big. Yeah, yeah, this is too far. Well, I, I, I know some guys that I, they took me under the wing and, so I'll tell you something I don't tell anybody else, but we saw we saw King Kong. <laughs> he was that big. Yeah. And it wasn't like an eight foot tall Bigfoot, it was a bigger one. And I talked to a couple other guys that witnessed one for ten, twelve minutes, twelve excuse me, twelve to fifteen minutes across a lake, uh, turning over boulders, and they said it had to be at least ten foot tall. And uh, anyway, there's a lot of stories out there, but you're right, a lot of people won't come forward and talk about it. they will if there's an eight foot one or a seven foot one, but they can't they can't buy into 12, 15 feet for some reason. <laughs> yeah, no, and I've had a couple of those on the show. They didn't describe him as Sasquatch. They described him more like the Kandahar giant, but uh, yeah. those guys wouldn't. Well, yeah, what's, what is a Sasquatch? Do yeah. we know? No. Not to my we, knowledge, we don't know. It depends on who you talk to. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing. Nobody knows. <laughs> yeah. No, that's true. But enthusiasm, let's see, I just put this in my PowerPoint, program, this little statement. Enthusiasm to believe in Bigfoot doesn't make a free thinker out of you. Willingness to be open-minded about what they could be does. I just try to remain open-minded, and you do too, it sounds like. And I would encourage your audience to remain open-minded because none of us really know. Yeah, and I think the, the actual truth might be more terrifying than most people would like to know. Uh, what's actually going on in this world. I think most people would go nuts if they found out how mm-hmm. weird, weird this world actually is. That's probably why it's so suppressed by our government, because it's going to throw a curve into a lot of uh, a lot of history books, uh, including Darwinism. It's going to throw a kink into religions. Uh, it's going to throw a curve into everything that's been written uh, about humanity. No, I couldn't agree more. Uh, Ron Moorhead again. If you go to ronmoorhead.com, you can check out Voices in the Wilderness, his book, and the Sierra Sounds, which are, which are my favorite. I know there's two CDs, and it really is my favorite to uh, listen to some of those sounds. And they're terif- Actually, some of those sounds are terrifying, Ron, to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> Should have been there, Wes. <laughs> yeah, I think I would have left. I'd been like, I'm done. Well, one guy did. He wouldn't go back. <laughs> yeah, I don't blame him. I don't blame him. But I can't wait to check out your new book, The Quantum Bigfoot. And you'll have to come back on when you're done, when that actually gets published. I I, I honestly can't wait to read it. I'm going to read it from cover to cover and uh, let you know uh, what I think. Because, you know, there, like I said, there's a lot of weird things that go on, and I don't have an explanation for it. And I do love quantum physics, uh, mm-hmm. so I'll be Good. real interested to uh, to read it. Well, thanks for having me on. Thanks, Ron. And that's it for tonight, everyone. If you made it this far, <laughs> what is it, like three hours and 20-some-odd uh, minutes? I don't know. Uh, if you made it this far, God bless you. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I hope it wasn't too much. I just wanted to do an extra show, extra long show for everyone. I know it's a Christmas season, and some people, uh, you know, they got families, and, you know, they're busy, probably not listening. And I know there's some people out there working and, and going through tough times, and, and uh, hopefully it took your mind off, your, you know, things going on in your life. 
Uh, and I really do from the bottom of my heart. I know I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over my words, but from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for listening to the show and allowing me to come in every week and inviting me in your home and, and just taking the time to listen to the show. Uh, thank you again so much, everyone. I hope you have a great Christmas. I hope you have a great new year. I will see you guys next time. Have a good night, everyone.